police investigation following what he describes as his vindication. Police searching for missing mother of three gaming lords discover a body in a nearby river. Relief and happiness. The grandmother of Alex Batty on speaking to the missing British boy and his imminent return home. Uh, coming up, I will be joined by our news reviewers, the comedian Gronje McGuire and the editor of The Big Issue, Paul McNamee, uh, both of them here until nine o'clock, giving us their take on the biggest stories of the week. So, what will we be talking about? Here's one. Hooray for Harry, as the Duke of Sussex toasts his success in suing Middle Group newspapers. But what does it mean for the rest of his legal battle against the tabloid press? And it was a... Uh, back to school for Rishi Sunak this week, but was he able to teach the right wing of the Conservative Party a lesson as his Rwanda legislation passed its first big test in the Commons? The PM can enjoy a Merry Christmas for now, but will it be an unhappy new year? Uh, also ahead in the sport at quarter two, the Premier League has made the welcome appointment of its first female referee, but in the week when a club president in Turkey is banned for life for punching an official, what can football do to bring an end to its reffing hell? Great to have your company. We are here for the next three hours. Hold on tight. It's Friday night. Evening all. The Israel Defence Forces have tonight admitted killing three hostages being held by Hamas in a friendly fire attack in Gaza. Meanwhile, a cameraman working for the news network Al Jazeera has also been killed after being caught in what's understood to have been an Israeli airstrike. Samar Abu Dhaka and his colleague Wael Al Dadu were reporting from a school turned shelter in the southern city of Khan Yunus. Well, let's head to Jerusalem where we'll find our international correspondent Alex Rossi. Uh, Alex, ju just take us through that which we know as regards the, the three hostages, the IDF admitting that they have been killed and, and, and what we are at least describing as a friendly fire incident. Yeah, the details, Neil, are only really just starting to emerge about this. We've heard from IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari. Now, as we understand it, it happened in the north of Gaza. IDF troops were involved in uh, what have been described as fierce uh, gun battles, and they mistakenly identified uh, three Israeli hostages as a threat and opened fire. Now, in this statement, the IDF says that it bears uh, responsibility for what it describes um, as a tragic incident. Now, they go on to say it was an area where um, the IDF soldiers were encountering what they call terrorists, many of them, uh, including suicide bombers and open fire. Now, we understand that the hostages, um, when they, they realised that, that from, from looking at the bodies, uh, were taken to Israel, where further identification was carried out. And uh, two of them have now been named. The first hostage as Yotam Haim. Um, he was abducted by Hamas from Kfar Aza. And Samar Talalka, who was abducted from near Am. Now, the third hostage, the family of the third hostage, have asked for his name not to be made public, not to be released um, to the media. Now, obviously, this is going to have repercussions. What repercussions exactly, we don't know. We should stress that within Israel, there is uh, an enormous amount of support for the war to eliminate Hamas and the threat. Many people here, you'll stop them and speak to them. They will say October the 7th should not, be happen should not happen again. But at the same time, because of the, the protests uh, and the, the, the way that the hostages' families have been conducting themselves and pushing their message, questioning the government and their kind of all-out offensive in Gaza, there's another side to this. Many people also think that actually the concentration, the focus of the war cabinet should be on getting the hostages out of Gaza because of this very thing, the, the, the problem that they may end up being killed in, in crossfire or what's been described as friendly fire incident. Now, how this changes things going forwards, we don't know. In terms of the actual negotiations, we think that they are kind of stuttering along at best. There is a channel being worked, we understand, on the Egyptian side, uh, but we're also hearing from sources within Israel, Neil, saying that the, the Israeli government believes that by degrading Hamas 
Uh, further, they'll have a stronger negotiating hand when it comes to the hostage releases. But of course, uh, this, what, what's happened, this tragic incident, could change things quite dramatically. And, and Alex, um, evidence, if, we, if, if it were needed, of just how dangerous it is working as a, as a journalist inside Gaza at the moment. A sad day for our colleagues over at Al Jazeera. Yeah, I mean, I think it just underlines um, the difficulties, the dangers of operating inside Gaza. So many journalists, Neil, have now been um, killed since this conflict, this ground offensive started in October the 7th. We understand the uh, Al Jazeera team were operating down in Khan Yunis. Uh, that's the, the largest city in the south of Gaza. Um, when they, they, were, they, they were caught up in an incident, we understand that the, the, the reporter managed to get himself to hospital, but the, the, the cameraman um, couldn't. He was caught in shelling and, and, and stuck where he was and ultimately died from his injuries. But again, I think for, for lots of people, this will also underline kind of the, the message that we've heard from President Biden earlier in the week. He kind of broke rank, really, with this full-throated uh, support for Israel and its campaign, uh, describing the, the bombing as indiscriminate and saying that Israel is beginning to lose uh, global support because of the rising number of casualties. And of course, it's, as we know, it's not just journalists. The Hamas-led health ministry says that, what, almost 19,000 people, most of them as civilians, have been killed since this offensive um, started. So certainly there is now pressure from the United States for Israel to, to wind up this very intense operation uh, that, it's had, that it's had and moved to a more targeted phase. Now, what the reaction from the Israelis has been is actually no amount of international pressure, according to the Prime Minister, will stop them from going forwards with their military objectives to eliminate Hamas. Of course, this incident with the hostages may actually change that somewhat and put the brakes on, but certainly they are unbowed. They say they will carry on, and it doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks, they have to eliminate Hamas from Gaza. Alex, many thanks. A great day for truth. That's Prince Harry's reaction after winning 15 claims against Mirror Group newspapers of unlawfully uh, gathering uh, information for stories published about him. With the prince absent from court, it was left to his lawyer, David Sharborn KC, to read out a statement on Harry's behalf, calling the ruling vindicating and affirming. He was also awarded more than £140,000 in damages. Our correspondent Laura Bundock reports on a landmark day at the Royal Courts of Justice. Uh, just a warning, her report does contain flash photography from early on. In his fight with Fleet Street, it's round one to Prince Harry. A judge ruling he is the victim of hacking and blagging, obtaining information by deceit. Not only that, but senior staff at Mirror Group knew about it and turned a blind eye. Read by his barrister, Harry's statement said it all. Today's ruling is vindicating and affirming. I've been told that slaying dragons will get you burned. But in light of today's victory and the importance of what is doing what is needed for a free and honest press, it is a worthwhile price to pay. The mission continues. The judgment said there was extensive phone hacking at Mirror Group Papers. It considered 33 articles about Prince Harry and ruled 15 of them were written using information unlawfully obtained. Mirror Group said nothing, none of those articles was illegal. Zero, zilch, nada. But in fact, half of them were. And if you extend that to the rest of the articles, that's going to be about 60 articles. That's a hell of a lot of unlawful activity that he's been able to prove, even though it was years ago and many of the documents have been destroyed. This ruling means over 100 more claims could now be heard. In a statement, a Mirror Group spokesperson said, we welcome today's judgment that gives the business the necessary clarity to move forward from events that took place many years ago. Where historical wrongdoing took place, we apologise unreservedly, have taken full responsibility and paid appropriate compensation. And to that, Prince Harry was awarded £140,600. The judge concluding his phone was hacked to a modest extent. 
But this wasn't about the money, it was about those responsible, including Piers Morgan. The judge said there can be no doubt he knew about phone hacking while at the mirror. I said all I'm going to say, I'm really sorry. He hit back bullishly. Prince Harry's outrage at media intrusion into the private lives of the royal family is only matched by his own ruthless, greedy and hypocritical enthusiasm for doing it himself. He talked today about the appalling behaviour of the press. But this is a guy who's repeatedly trashed his family in public for hundreds of millions of dollars, even as two of its most senior and respected members were dying, his grandparents. Harry hasn't always won public support, but today was a victory. This isn't just a win for Prince Harry. For him, it's outright vindication. The tone of his statement is striking, laying bare an absolute determination to take on the tabloids. Harry's not finished, with two more tabloid cases to come. For now, though, the headlines about him, something he will want to read. Laura Bundock, Sky News. Mm, uh, well, Mirror Group newspapers have apologised unreservedly and taken full responsibility for their role in the Harry case. But with ongoing legal action against the publishers of the Daily Mail and The Sun, as well as dozens more claimants, this appears to be just the start rather than the end of a very long and public process. Our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer has more on the fallout from today's judgment. A partial victory for Prince Harry with profound implications for the British media landscape. While newspapers say they've moved on from the dark arts of 20 years ago, the passing of time doesn't stop those who were in charge back then from being any less culpable. The ruling that those in senior positions at MGN, like former chief executive Sly Bailey and former editor Piers Morgan, knew about hacking and blagging, now puts the ball firmly in the police's court. Despite Morgan's repeated denials over the years, if the law was indeed broken, it's no longer a civil matter, but a criminal one. I've never hacked a phone or told anybody else to hack a phone, and nobody has produced any actual evidence to prove that I did. About time, say the whistleblowers, who have repeatedly alleged top management knew and covered up. It's difficult for me because, you know, I, I don't want to see journalists go to jail or, or lose their jobs, but at the very least they could tell the truth. If you're wondering whether those employing Morgan for his journalistic integrity might consider taking him off air in the interim, well, that'll be for his talk TV boss Richard Wallace to decide, also a former editor of The Mirror. More widely, the court's ruling will have a domino effect for other newspapers involved in legal proceedings with Prince Harry. Many of those private investigators who worked for MGN worked for their titles too. It, of course, also calls into question everything that was said under oath back in 2011 at the Leveson Inquiry. The judge finding that at the same time as the public inquiry into culture, practices and ethics was taking place, remarkably, the practice of unlawful information gathering still continued. Up until now, the Conservatives have leaned towards less regulation, in fact, dropping the second part of the Leveson inquiry. But campaigners would argue that this judgment is evidence of a press regulatory system that's failed. The question is whether the government will want to change anything. Will they want to go to war with the newspapers with an election looming? From the Prime Minister, strong words, but nothing promised. I believe, obviously, in a, a free and fair press, but also believe everyone needs to operate uh, within the law. That's what anyone would expect, and that's exactly what you know this country's always been proud to stand behind. A royal reckoning with print media unleashing a can of worms. I hope it would put the fear into the boots of newspaper editors up and down the country that, look, if you use illegal means, whether it's phone hacking, whether it's private investigators, wiretapping, whatever, to obtain those stories, you will be found out. The ruling might be over practices from a different era, but the judgment is damning. At a time when the newspaper world is dying, of redundancies, of struggling readership numbers, the fallout from Harry's battle for accountability looks set to unleash hell when the industry was already on its knees. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Specialist divers looking for a missing mother of three have found a woman's body in the River Wensum in Norwich. Gaynor Lord was last seen in the city centre a week ago when she left work early. Sky's Martin Brunt reports. By midday, the police search focused on a new and precise part of the river. A small orange boy marked the spot. 
first sonar equipment was used to scan the area. It established what appeared to be a body. Then a single diver was sent down into the swollen waters. He spent a few minutes submerged before confirming the tragic discovery. Today, police specialist divers have found the body of a female in the River Wensum after a detailed and methodical search over the past few days. Whilst we establish her identity, our thoughts are with Gaynor's family at this difficult and distressing time. Mother of three, Gaynor Lord, vanished on Friday afternoon a week ago. She left work early. CCTV caught her journey through Norwich City Centre. At times, she appears in a hurry. At one point, she dodges her way through moving traffic. She spent half an hour in the grounds of Norwich Cathedral, but police have no evidence she met anyone. The last sighting showed her heading to Wensum Park, where her phone, coat and other items were found. The body was discovered in the river, about 300 yards from where police think Gaynor went into the water. They don't believe she was the victim of a crime. As the tragic news spread through the city, sympathisers brought flowers to the park gates. I followed the story constantly since it broke on Friday and prayed with everything that she would, you know, hopefully be found safe and well. After initial forensic tests, the body was taken away for closer examination. Police still need to confirm the cause of death. There'll be a post-mortem examination in coming days and they will continue to try to establish what it was that drove Gaynor to disappear in the first place. Police were supporting Gaynor's husband and children whose worst fears have been realised. Martin Brunt, Sky News, Norwich. The British boy found in France after being missing for six years is expected to return to the UK this weekend. Alex Batty, who's originally from Oldham, was 11 when he disappeared with his mother and grandfather during a family holiday to Spain in 2017. Uh, French prosecutors have said today that Alex wanted to leave his spiritual community after his mother wanted to move to Finland. As Sky's Adam Parsons reports. On this isolated stretch of road, Alex Batty's life changed this is where he was found, walking through the rain in the middle of the night, six years after he disappeared. Alex, pictured here at the age of 11, says he was taken to a series of communes with limited access to the outside world. They would travel house to house with solar panels. They only used car sharing and they didn't have their own vehicle, always in places with large houses where there were many families with around 10 people, coming and going, never the same people. Alex said he was taken to Morocco, Spain, and then here to France. He told authorities his grandfather died six months ago, but said the final straw was when his mother told him she wanted to move again. His mother indicated he was going to leave with him to Finland. This young man understood that this needed to stop, so he decided to leave where he was with his mother and walked for four days and four nights. He was just walking at night and sleeping during the day. Alex was found by this man, Fabian Acidini. Last night, he told Sky News that Alex told him he just wanted to get home to his grandmother. So Fabian took him to this police station in the town of Revel, 30 miles from Toulouse, where Alex, exhausted, fell asleep on the floor. In a statement, his grandmother, Susan Caruana, who is Alex's legal guardian, said, I cannot begin to express my relief and happiness that Alex has been found safe and well, I spoke to him last night and it was so good to hear his voice and see his face again. Six years after his disappearance, Alex Batty decided to leave his mother behind and trekked for four days to end up here in the middle of the night, in the pouring rain, clutching a skateboard. And this is where he was rescued. Now, on the one hand, this is a tale of endurance and fortitude with a happy reunion to come. But it's also one about estrangement and fear. The whereabouts of Alex's mother are still unknown. That investigation will come, but the next step will be Alex's return to Oldham tomorrow. Adam Parsons, Sky News, South West France.
You're watching Friday Night here on Sky News. Coming up, we will be reviewing the week's news with the help of Gronje Maguire and Paul McNamee. There they are, over there, as you can see. Uh, and we will be starting with uh, Harry's victorious day in court. A judge says he was hacked by the Mirror in a case that could have significant consequences for the press and indeed the Prince. As one person dies in the latest migrant channel sinking, we will be discussing the ongoing Tory turmoil over stopping illegal crossings. And this was a man's world, thank goodness it no longer is. Uh, the Premier League preparing to welcome its first female referee. All that and more after this. It's actually based on a family tradition that my mom did for us when we were growing up. And so when I was very, very young, I don't remember a Christmas without our elf. We would wake up every morning from the U.S. Thanksgiving through Christmas Day and our elf had gone to Santa Claus, provided a report and was back in our home in a new spot every morning. And so we would race out of bed to go find our elf. His name was Fisby. And it truly was the most magical way to experience the season. And so many, many years later, my sister and I wanted to share our tradition with the world. And that's how the Elf on the Shelf was born. Elves fly back and forth to Santa, as you might imagine. And so they really have individual personalities. So if your family is really creative, you have a lot going on, your Elf will probably be creative too. And if you're more of a laid back family, the Elf usually takes on that personality of your family. So you name the elf, it gets its magic, and then it's going to be off to the races. There are so many fun things that elves do. Sometimes they're pretty chill. They just, you know, hang out at the house and watch and report, which is a big deal. And other times you're going to see all manner of creativity. Sometimes they like to get in the cereal box. They tend to like the bathroom for some reason. I'm not sure what that's about, but it tends to be very popular. Once you read the book, you will understand the entire tradition in its entirety. So everything from you can't touch the elf or it could lose its magic all the way through the tradition. It really is about families spending time together and enjoying the magic of the season. And while there are imposter elves out there pretending to be the actual true elf on the shelf, the magical elf from Santa, it truly is a way for wonder and magic and holiday beauty to come into focus. Welcome back to Friday night. Time, of course, now to introduce our panel for the evening with us for the next two hours. Uh, the comedian and writer, Gronje Maguire, and Paul McNamee, the editor of The Big Issue. They're both here. Great to see you guys. Uh, so what shall we start with today? Mm, Prince Harry, how about him? Uh, he won a huge legal victory in his action against the tabloid press. A High Court judge agreed that he was the victim of extensive phone hacking over a six-year period. Well, at the High Court, uh, Mr Justice Fancourt <coughs> ruled in a privacy case brought by the Duke of Sussex against the publisher of the Daily Mirror. He found that 15 of the 33 articles mentioned in court about Prince Harry were the products of phone hacking or other unlawful information gathering. Uh, but more than that, the judge also concluded that Piers Morgan and former Mirror chief executive Sly Bailey were aware that phone hacking was taking place. Let's bring in the panel at this point. Um, Paul, let's start with you this evening. I mean, wh what do you make of this? I mean, I, can, I think I can understand why Harry is, uh, is being so triumphant about this, because, you know, the stuff that he's been saying for several years mm. has now been proved. He's 140 grand richer as a result of it. I don't think that'll be the main thing for him, but, but vindication, I think, is a word that he will, we will hear time and time again from him. Yes, and then you do begin to, to see why certain elements of, of the press had it in for Harry and Meghan for quite some time in order to clearly make them some kind of bet noir that they cannot be trusted because they knew this was coming, potentially. Mm. I think the, the, the outcome 
it, it's fascinating because it, as well as proving Harry was, was correct in what he was saying, and then other people as well, because there were others within um, this particular hearing, it, it, it sets it up with people like Piers Morgan, who have claimed all the way along, and today again, he was quite combative in, mm. in his um, arguments, saying he knew nothing about it, which clearly, it, it cannot be true. You know, the judges ruled that this is not true, that he knew all about it and that he was um, knee deep I in mean, it. Uh, to, to, to be fair to Piers, I mean, he, he was not afforded the opportunity to speak as a witness either for Harry or, or the other side. He was not asked to provide a statement. In fact, do you know what? Should we, should we have a quick listen? what Piers Morgan said outside his house a little bit earlier on today. Here's his defence. The judgment finds there is just one article relating to the prince published in the Daily Mirror during my entire nine-year tenure as editor that he thinks may have involved some unlawful information gathering. To be clear, I had then and still have zero knowledge of how that particular story was gathered. All his other claims against the Daily Mirror under my leadership were rejected. With regard to the judge's other references to me in his judgment, I also want to reiterate, as I've consistently said for many years now, I've never hacked a phone or told anybody else to hack a phone. And nobody has produced any actual evidence to prove that I did. I wasn't called as a witness, it's important for people to know this, by either side in the case, nor was I asked to provide any statement. I would have very happily agreed to do either or both of those things had I been asked. Nor did I have a single conversation with any of the Mirror Group lawyers throughout the entire legal process. I mean, Gronje, I mean, there's his defence, such as it is. He also went on to have, I have to say, I, I thought a kind of perhaps a slightly over the top attack on, on Harry himself, mm -hmm. uh, saying that he was a man who had courted the press, who had used the press, which, which seems to me a, a little bit of whataboutery on, on a day where, you know, uh, one of the justices has said, you know, Piers Morgan knew about it. Yeah, I just, I want to take a moment, just, I'm just so grateful that The Crown is over and now we've got this spin-off. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Harry's got his own spin-off. I love this. It's petty. It's vengeful. It is what we need. And I think Piers Morgan is such an idiot. He's such an idiot. His whole persona is like, I'm the ultimate insider. Don't mess with me. I know everything. But now his defence is, oh my God, I had no idea. What? Tabloids were hacking people's mobile phones? What? I didn't know when I was editor of one of the biggest red tops. Well, is, well, is, that, is that the point? Is that the point, Paul, that even if you take um, Piers Morgan's denials at face value, I mean, this was clearly ongoing at that time when he was editor of the paper, and that if he didn't know about it, he should have known about it, because, you know, the burning question at the back of the editor's mind must always be, where on earth are you getting these stories from? I mean, it's Cod's Wallop. Of course, as an editor, you have to know what is going into your publication or what, you know, whether it's on pages or, or online. And if it is a story that's particularly juicy that you think is going to play well with, with some of your readers, the demographic of your readers, and it's going to push sales, you are going to ask where it came from. Of mm. course you're going to ask where it came from. This idea that um, he's this whiter than white young fella who said, oh, I don't want to rock the boat here. I'll just let it go. I'm not going to ask too many but, but, questions. But doesn't he have a point when he says, look, there was one story in this case that apparently I was, during my tenure as editor, prove it. You know, if you're going to say that I knew, prove it. Where is the evidence? There is a pattern. There is a clear pattern with the hierarchy of that publisher. Now, he could have had a conversation with the chief executive. He could have had a conversation with anybody to, to say, is this going on? The idea that senior editors in, in the press at that time didn't know this was going on is, is beyond ridiculous, as has now been proved. But I think the more damaging part, rather than just this for Piers Morgan or for Murrow Group, is for all of the press, because yeah. it puts, it makes it easy for everyone to go, well, they're all at it. You know, we still can't trust the papers. We still can't trust any publishers. You can trust the big issue, by the way. They can, <laughs> well done, well they done. Will, they will, this, everybody gets tarred with this, you know? And that's, that's damaging. But, I, but I, and I suppose the, the follow-on from that, John, yeah, is this isn't, this isn't going to just be limited to Mirror Group newspapers. The Sun, the Mail, they're in the spotlight as well over there. I just, I just, 
I love it. It makes me almost see the point of having a royal family. <laughs> almost. <laughs> that this is what Prince Harry is dedicating all his time to. I, th I just think Princess Diana will be so proud. Mm. And that's all that matters to me. I can, I can tell. <laughs> uh, Gronya, Paul, pause right there. Uh, stay right where you are. Coming up, we, of course, have uh, much, much more from our news reviewers, including a story we have done on this uh, programme before. Uh, the internal Tory turmoil over how to stop illegal channel boat crossings. As, let's not forget this, another person has died trying to make that deadly and occasionally controversial journey. We'll be discussing that. And as President Zelensky tours the world, we will be discussing whether global support for wars both against Russia and Hamas is true. Welcome back. Now, when does a win not really feel like a win? Perhaps when, as Prime Minister, you secure a majority for the first parliamentary vote on plans to deport channel migrants to Rwanda. But on all sides of your party, your own MPs are making clear that they oppose the plans and that they intend to be back for round two of the fight as early as January next year. The most serious challenges. There are meetings all the way through today to try and get um, Tory MPs to support the bill. The British people want an end to illegal immigration. This bill could be so much better. Let's make it better. Real hardliners opposed to this bill. We have decided collectively that we cannot support the bill tonight. It's really unclear whether this bill will pass. I 
eyes to the right, 330. The nose to the left, 269. Yeah. The PM will be hugely relieved. But this nowhere near over. Uh, Gronje and Paul are still here. Gronje to you. I mean, it, I, I presume for comedians, the Rwanda bill is the gift that just keeps on giving. Manages to get through the second reading. Now it's going to have another vote come January, at which point, well, you saw him. You saw him in the little montage there. Uh, the likes of Marc Francois will be standing, smiling in front of the cameras once again, uh, telling us what they think about the biggest political issue of the day, you know, getting 200 people deported to Rwanda. It's just, I find it just so grindingly grim. It's mm. just, it feels so petty and so petulant. It just, it just sort of starts everything that is so irritating, irritating about Rishi Sunak. It just, it feels like he thinks he's three steps ahead and it's this game that he's playing with other people in the Tory party, whereas everybody else, there's no popular support for it. And it just feels like it's just a waste of everybody's time. So why, why, is, why is he persisting with it then? Has he just been boxed into it? There's, there's no other option given, you know, he's stuck, it, stuck his colours firmly to the mast. And... It feels, as an idiot outsider, <laughs> like he just thinks he's so clever and so smart and he's got this really brilliant idea that the rest of us don't understand and we just have to trust him on this. And rather than just, if you want to deal with legal immigration, just provide more funds funding for processing legal immigration. It's like, oh, no, 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 I've got this really clever, genius idea that is not practical and will never work. Mm. But he seems to have just bet everything on it. Paul? Well, I mean, everything that, that Grunge says, and, and added to this, is the ongoing cruelty of it. The, I don't know why the Tory party have decided that on this one issue, it's good to just be cruel. Um, I know that they have said stop the boats is one of the, the, the five key policies that Rishi Sunak is standing by. It's, it's T-shirt diplomacy. You know, there's nothing to it. It's just simply a phrase. There was a, a really interesting um, piece put together today by uh, John Dean Murdoch in the Financial Times. He looks at data and he looks at deep information and he's able to see where the situation is and where the country is according to that rather than the likes of Marc Francois and all those those people with their, their inflated egos standing the, outside the, buildings. The five groups in the Conservative Party, which we are now told, they, they started referring to themselves as the five families, with, with, without even a hint of irony. I mean, they, they, it is more like um, the life of Brian and splitters rather than something <laughs> that, that, that feels very heavyweight. But the thing with, with Murdoch is that he, he found that there, it, the, the rise in support for the Rwanda policy, and um, for immigration in particular, is in a very small core of potential Tory voters. Mm. And everybody else, even those who voted Conservative the last election, are falling away. So, as Grundy says, they bet the House. They put everything into this cruel, inane policy that will never work. If they turned it around and said, you know what, we do need immigration, there's some positives, here's how we can make it work, mm -hmm. and we will look for better routes in. If they did that, I think people would be stunned and went, Hold on a minute, we, we mm. could have something else. But then what would Mark Francois do of, a, of an evening? But I, I, I suppose, though, I mean, Gronje, I've reported on people dying in the channel goodness only knows how many times over the past few years, and every time it kind of... It, it, it slightly sticks in the craw because we know that there's an issue, we know that people are attempting it, and yet it still happens. You know, human lives are being lost in, in, in the channel. I mean, isn't, isn't Rishi Sunak right to try, try frankly, anything... But he's not willing to try anything, is he? He's willing to try this real one extremist plan that he thinks will be a dog whistle to people who might vote for him in the next general election. Mm. He's not willing to cooperate with other countries, cooperate with France, cooperate with the EU. I, I think that's the big problem. It's, yeah. it's such a, it's a human... It's, it's unbelievably heartbreaking. I, it's, I don't like... It's, it, I think people feel really uncomfortable with it being used as this political issue when it is just an... It's, you know, a heartbreaking situation that yeah. people find themselves in. I, I want to move us on to, to, to our next topic. Um, the, the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. Now, um, both of those have, have developed as wars of words this week. After, well, well, days and days and days, months perhaps even, of staunch support, uh, President Joe Biden said Israel is starting to lose global support 
over its indiscriminate bombing of Gaza. Uh, meanwhile, crucial American political support for Ukraine appears to be cooling. Now, in previous w visits to Washington, uh, Zelensky was given a standing ovation by Congress. This week, he was only allowed to meet senators behind closed doors, and the Speaker of the House didn't appear in public uh, with the Ukrainian leader. Um, Paul, let, let, let's start with, with, with Gaza. And it's something we explored on this show last week with, with um, senior advisor to the Israeli Prime Minister, Mark Regev, you know, that, that actually the language that is being used by Israel's allies, its allies, not its critics, is, is hardening. Even this time last week, you had the UK's ambassador to the United Nations describing the civilian death toll as shocking. I mean, that's a diplomat using the word shocking. I think that there was an inevitability to this, though. The, the, if, if we look to see that there was a, a pattern that would develop, it would be absolute unilateral support for Israel in response to Hamas, in response to what Hamas did to Israeli people and to Jewish people and wanting to wipe them out. And so the world would support as they, they went in to try and get Hamas. Mm -hmm. But as, as the, the images have grown and as the, the catalogue of of horrors has grown, the you know the bombing of, of hospitals, the, the murder of children. I think inevitably that was going to pull back. So so it it, it is clear that this has happened because this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. It could. We we can't at the world as a world stand by and say this is fine. It's not fine, and that is that is clearly what's going to happen now. Israel will wait and and act according to what Biden says. And Biden in that message that you mentioned just there. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very bold statement, even if it is couched in very diplomatic terms. I mean, Gronje, just just focusing still just on 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 what is happening in in Gaza. I mean, look, it, it is possible for all of us to hold two ideas simultaneously in our head, isn't it? To on the one hand look back at what happened on October the seventh, the acts, the barbarism committed by a terrorist organisation Hamas on that day, and then look at what has been happening in terms of the Israeli response and people being moved around a very narrow piece of land in the Middle East and being told that one place is safe and then not, and civilians, men, women, children, all dying, and, and look at that and feel uneasy about it as well. It's just, it's so heartbreaking and it's so, hard not to just go to cliche to mm. describe how you feel about it. But I find it really strange because obviously on social media, there's so many people getting to rise about it. And I don't understand it because, you know, we're all in an agreement that it's two communities let, by, let down by their leadership. Like nobody's, there are no winners in this situation. It's just so awful. But, but aren't the Israelis hardening their position as well? I mean, this week, my colleague Mark Austin interviewed the, the, UK, the, the, the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom asked about, well, what about a two-state solution? No. No yeah. two-state solution, no state for Palestine. But that, I would see that as like, that's an example of the Israeli people mm. being let down by their, co yeah. their current government, mm. which is really heartbreaking. What, what then of the, of the situation in Ukraine? We've seen Vladimir Zelensky, not just in Washington, but touring Europe, and, and, and he's receiving a kind of a similar response in, in both places. In Washington, you've got Joe Biden pleading with the Republicans so that aid can be granted. In the European Union, you know, it's Viktor Orban in, in Hungary, Paul, that, 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 is, that is holding up the funding. Without it, I mean, it's game over for Ukraine. It does, but it looks like it's coming from two different directions and two different reasons. In the States, it is because um, of Congress not putting it through. For whatever reason, whether that is to try and uh, cut Biden off, to make it look as though he's an incapable president and to show support for I assume they want Trump to come back, mm. and Trump has been sympathetic to the Russian cause before. In Europe, it's, Orban is, has been a, a supporter of, of Putin in the past, and he is using that to his own personal advantage. So there's, there's two different reasons, but I think that the, the core thing is, is what you said there. It, if that backing doesn't come in, Ukraine is in a really, really terrible position. We know they've made advances in Donbass. We know that some of the things are working that they're trying to do but they can't go on without that extra uh, extra help. I mean, Gronje, just, just, just from conversations with friends, family, I mean, are people in your, in your circles still talking about Ukraine? Yeah, it's awful. I think it's just the way we, cons we consume news. Mm. It's a bit like, like an X Factor winner. You know, you have a period where you're in the news and everybody talks about you, and then a new X Factor winner comes around, and that's who everybody's talking about. And I really do think we just, we, like, like something I was talking about, I was like, what's happening in Syria? Is Syria just sorted? 
because we just we can't we, we've only got so much bandwidth mm. in our brain and so is that is that the fault then of, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm including myself in this mm. is it the fault of people like me working in the media or is it the fault of the consumer of news who's who, who's not sitting down and reading a newspaper from cover to cover in the mornings anymore I think it's the way we consume news I, I'm not saying you, it's you particular are why Zelensky can't get funding. Well, I hope not. <laughs> Thank goodness. You know, I don't have, I'm, I'm on many lists already. I'd rather not be on President Zelensky's hit list, frankly. But I do think, I think we just, it's like a TV series, like we box set certain news stories and then another news story comes out, we box at that. Mm. And it's very hard to, to keep all of the, yeah, the, the different storylines in our head at the same time. It, 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 it certainly is. Um, Gronya, Paul? Great to have you with us. You will be back uh, after 8 o'clock when we'll be continuing to discuss the week's news. You can have a breather for now. Uh, but for the rest of us, uh, we are going to be taking a short break. After it, we've got the sport with Teddy. And this was a man's world in sport. It's a step towards equality as the Premier League prepares to welcome its first female referee. That's next. I'm Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Come, come. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News at the Old Bailey. Welcome back. What a week for football referees. At first up, the good news. And there will be a woman in charge of a top flight match in England for the first time this Christmas, as well as a black referee for the first time in 15 years. But there were also those terrible scenes in Turkey, an official punched to the ground by, let's not forget, a club president. Uh, let's bring in Teddy standing by over at Sky Sports News. Teddy, good to see you. Um, I mean, I, I suppose we, we, we start with the positive stuff don't we? Um, Sam Allison, first black ref in, in 15 years. Rebecca Welch, first female referee. It, 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 it's nice to see the Premier League just diversifying the teeniest amount. Yeah, yeah the Football Association, the Premier League, the PGML under Howard Webb, their chief, been working on this uh, for a while, Neil. I think uh, this development idea, what a thousand referees in the men's game from traditionally unrepresented groups and a thousand female referees as well. Obviously we have female referees in the WSL. Rebecca Welsh has been in the Women's Super League, been in the Women's Champions League as well, has been breaking through 
to the men's game. Sam Allison, really interesting story. The first black official since Uriah Reddy, but here's uh, Rebecca Welsh refereeing in the championship. Allison, uh, first in 15 years, but also interesting this in terms of a lot of players complain about referees not having played at a decent level. Sam Allison actually played high level non league football, played England schoolboys football, representing Great Britain as well, was on the books at Bristol City, Swindon, and, and other clubs. And he says that actually he brings that expertise to it and Howard Reb, the PGMLO chief, they are trying to direct attention to lower league players as well, trying to get their attention, bring them into the fold. There have been female uh, officials before. We've seen that Sean Massey Ellis has been a referee assistant on the touchline. Uh, linesman or lineswoman, uh, we would call them in the old days for the past 15 years or so. Then we've had, going back to Wendy Toms in 97, ran the line in the Premier League. And Natalie Aspinall as well, but significant that Rebecca Welsh, first woman to be out there in the middle, facing all the heat in what's uh, a very difficult job and will be uh, in charge for Fulham against Burnley on December the 23rd, so a week tomorrow. And then Sam Allison takes charge of Sheffield United against Luton. An interesting Luton manager, Rob Edwards, talking about that today, saying that he remembers Sam from refereeing Forest Green, and they've sort of had a similar trajectory up the leagues, and uh, now Rob with, with Luton in the Premier League. So it's a nice, a nice story there, but it's a significant one with, with Allison as well, to think that 43% of players in the Premier League were black in the, in the census a couple of years ago, that there is representation a long time since Uriah Rennie was refereeing in the Premier League with Howard Webb, and Howard says he remembers Uriah well, and this is a positive step in, in that direction, but certainly work to be done in terms of uh, the overall picture of, of the refereeing uh, cast. Yeah, I, I, and don't worry, Teddy, I won't be asking you uh, what Joey Barton thinks of Rebecca Welch's uh, appointment. But but what about, um, like, we've got to talk about it, those, those dark events that we saw out in Turkey. Uh, you know, a club president, you know, being suspended, you know, being ejected from football, you know, for, for, for the rest of life. I can understand the lifetime ban, and I can understand why people are, are, are really up in arms about this. But we, we, we have been here before, haven't we? I mean, we have seen referees in top-flight football you know, being assaulted, be it by players or indeed by, by people in the stands. Or maybe, I'm, or am I wrong? Well, we've seen referees chase, certainly in South American football. I think in Europe this was unprecedented. I think in the internet age, the fact that these pitches went round the world, Turkish Super League, high-level uh, play, and Gadaguchu president Farouk Kocha coming on. This, uh, by the way, uh, Farouk Kocha, two-time member of the Turkish parliament, an MP, politician, president of the club, dismayed after two sendings off and his side conceding a goal against Rizespor, a 1-1 draw, with a straight right to the face of Halil Umut Mela, sends a referee to the ground, and then even more disturbing there, you see the referee, but was actually kicked in the head by a couple of other people weighing in at the time. And I think it will be very chastening, because what we talked about with Rebecca Welsh and Sam Allison is, is Howard Webb and the PGO Mela trying to encourage people to take up refereeing. Anyone who's played Sunday morning football, watch Sunday morning football, will know about the abuse that, that referees have faced there. There's been experiments with cameras to try and protect them, because it's often young boys and young girls going into potentially situations with, with amateur uh, men's teams, women's teams. So it's a, it's a chastening job at the best of times, and certainly those pictures that have reverberated around the world won't have uh, encouraged people to take it up, and hopefully there will be you know, sanctions that, that will scare people. The fact that Kocha has been banned for life from football, a £54,000 fine for the club and Karaguchu, and they're going to play five games behind closed doors, but certainly a very shocking scenes, and hopefully we won't see them again. Fingers crossed. Uh, Teddy, over to you for the rest of the sport. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with vitality. Well, Stuart, it's been a few months now since the end of what was an incredible Ashes series. How are you adjusting now to life after playing cricket? Yeah, really enjoying it. You know, I think ultimately finishing on my own terms was really important for me and I knew that I wanted to finish um, by my last ball playing for England. Uh, England versus Australia was a, a major pinnacle for me in Ashes cricket and it was such a exciting and exhilarating series that I almost got to the stage where I don't know if it gets any better than this really. So yeah, that, it, was, it was great to be able to sort of make the decision on my own, finish on my own terms and um, I don't think it will really properly hit me until the test team play again and Jimmy Anderson and Ben Stokes are walking out with an England cap on in their whites, I think that might sort of feel real that I, I won't ever do that again. But no, at the moment, I've got no regrets and, and feel really happy. In the book, you spoke about the fact that retirement only really came to you during the Old Trafford tests. 
So you came to a massive decision quite quickly. Yeah, within 10 days, I think. So yeah, it was pretty stressful. You know, ultimately, any time you walk away from something you love, it's really difficult. And I was loving playing cricket. I was loving working under Stokes and Baz. Uh, it was great fun. I didn't feel much pressure. Uh, the communication was really good. And I was bowling really well and felt fit. So a lot of those things would say, carry on playing. And I honestly felt like I could do another couple of years. But I kept sort of bringing myself back to what's my next Everest, what's my next major challenge. I always need a challenge because I've got this goal to always continuously improve. I need something to charge towards and, and chase. And This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Thanks, Teddy. Time for the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. A prolonged spell of very heavy rain will be affecting northwest Scotland this weekend and could lead to flooding, landslides, travel disruption, and power cuts. Already, it is a wetter and windier picture across northern and western parts of Scotland. Elsewhere, a cloudy evening with some spots of light rain or drizzle, mainly over western hills. Uh, tonight's going to be relatively mild and frost free under a blanket of cloud with further outbreaks of rain in the northwest. Few clear spells are possible in the east. Uh, rain heavy at times will continue to affect northwest Scotland on Saturday, leading to an increased risk of flooding, mudslips, and possible landslides. Elsewhere, a cloudy day with drizzly rain over western hills, mild for all, windy in the north. An exceptional amount of rainfall could fall over the hills of Highland and Argyll, uh, with the rain lasting into Monday. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in the next hour, the Israel Defence Force admits mistakenly killing three hostages during its Gaza operations. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Coming up in the second hour of the show, we will have more from our news reviewers as we determine our heroes and villains of the past seven days. 
And we're asking if Granny was right, and the old ones really are the best when it comes to Christmas number one. But first, the headlines this hour. And Israel has admitted killing hostages being held by Hamas in a friendly fire incident in Gaza. On the day, a cameraman also died in an IDF airstrike. Harry has won his hacking case against Mirror Group newspapers and has called for a police investigation following what he describes as his vindication. Police searching for missing mother of three Gaynor Lords have discovered a body in a nearby river. Relief and happiness, the grandmother of Alex Batty on speaking to the missing British boy and his imminent return home. Introduce you to our news reviewers, the comedian Gronje McGuire and the editor of The Big Issue, Paul McNamee. Uh, well, they're both still with us and they will be helping us with our regular feature, Good Week, Bad Week, in which you will be discovering why David Davis MP became an, an unlikely hero for one homeless person attacked outside Parliament. Now, that's uh, Noddy Holder. Uh, but it's highlighted by Paul in next week's Big Issue, Christmas, far from the most wonderful time of the year for thousands of people forced to sleep rough over the festive period. Let's make sense of this one. Uh, can you believe it is 50 years since he was number one? Uh, in a week when the charts are still dominated by crimbo classics from the 70s, 80s and 90s, Don Powell from Slate will be telling us while the old ones are the best. And this is a story close to my heart. Uh, speaking of Christmas classics, it is game on the biggest sporting event of the festive season, World's Strongest Man aside, at the World Darts Championship is underway. Can Michael Bully Boy Smith retain the title at Ali Pali? Great to have your company. We are here until 10 o'clock. Hold on tight, it's Friday night. Evening all. The Israel Defence Forces have tonight admitted killing three hostages being held by Hamas in a friendly fire attack in Gaza. Well, in just the last hour, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, described the deaths as an unbearable tragedy. Meanwhile, a cameraman working for the news network Al Jazeera has also been killed after being caught in what's understood to have been an Israeli airstrike. Samar Abu Dhaka and his colleague Wael Al Dadu were reporting from a school turned shelter in the southern city of Khan Yunus. Uh, with the latest, our international correspondent Alex Rossi from Jerusalem. We've heard from IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari. Now, as we understand it, it happened in the north of Gaza. IDF troops were involved in uh, what have been described as fierce uh, gun battles, and they mistakenly identified. Uh, three Israeli hostages as a threat and opened fire. Now, in this statement, the IDF says that it bears uh, responsibility for what it describes um, as a tragic incident. Now, they go on to say it was an area where um, the IDF soldiers were encountering what they call terrorists, many of them, uh, including suicide bombers, and they opened fire. Now, we understand that the hostages, um, when they, they realized that, that from, from looking at the bodies, uh, were taken to Israel, where further identification was carried out. And uh, two of them have now been named. The first hostage as Yotam Haim. Um, he was abducted by Hamas from Kfar Aza. And Samar Talalka, who was abducted from near Am. Now, the third hostage, the family of the third hostage, have asked for his name not to be made public, not to be released um, to the media. Now, obviously, this is going to have repercussions. What repercussions exactly, we don't know. We should stress that within Israel, there is uh, an enormous amount of support for the war to eliminate Hamas and the threat. Many people here, you'll stop them and speak to them. They will say October the 7th should not, be happen should not happen again. But at the same time, because of the, the protests, uh, and the, the, the way that the hostages' families have been conducting themselves and pushing their message, questioning the government and their kind of all-out offensive in Gaza, there's another side to this. Many people also think that actually the concentration, the focus of the war cabinet should be on getting the hostages out of Gaza because of this very thing, the, the, the problem that they may end up being killed in, in crossfire or what's been described as friendly fire incident. Now, how this changes things going forwards, 
we don't know. In terms of the actual negotiations, we think that they are kind of stuttering along at best. There is a channel being worked, we understand, on the Egyptian side. Uh, but we're also hearing from sources within Israel, Neil, saying that the, the Israeli government believes that by degrading Hamas uh, further, they'll have a stronger negotiating hand when it comes to the hostage releases. But, of course, uh, this, what, what's happened, this tragic incident, could change things quite dramatically. Alex Ross, you there. Uh, well, in just the last few minutes, the third hostage killed in today's incident has, in fact, been identified. The family of Alan Shamris say he was kidnapped from a kibbutz by Hamas on October the 7th. They also say the IDF has expressed its deep remorse. Now, a great day for truth at that Prince Harry's reaction after winning 15 claims against Mirror Group newspapers of unlawfully gathering information for stories published about him. Well, with the Prince absent from court, it was left to his lawyer, David Sharborn KC, uh, to read out a statement on Harry's behalf, calling the ruling vindicating and affirming. He was also awarded more than £140,000 in damages. Our correspondent, Laura Bundock, reports on a landmark day at the Royal Courts of Justice. In his fight with Fleet Street, it's round one to Prince Harry, a judge ruling he is the victim of hacking and blagging, obtaining information by deceit. Not only that, but senior staff at Mirror Group knew about it and turned a blind eye. Read by his barrister, Harry's statement said it all. Today's ruling is vindicating and affirming. I've been told that slaying dragons will get you burned. But in light of today's victory and the importance of what is doing what is needed for a free and honest press, it is a worthwhile price to pay. The mission continues. The judgment said there was extensive phone hacking at Mirror Group Papers. It considered 33 articles about Prince Harry and ruled 15 of them were written using information unlawfully obtained. Mirror Group said nothing, none of those articles was illegal. Zero, zilch, nada. But in fact, half of them were, and if you extend that to the rest of the articles, that's going to be about 60 articles. That's a hell of a lot of unlawful activity that he's been able to prove, even though it was years ago and many of the documents have been destroyed. This ruling means over 100 more claims could now be heard. In a statement, a Mirror Group spokesperson said, we welcome today's judgment that gives the business the necessary clarity to move forward from events that took place many years ago. Where historical wrongdoing took place, we apologise unreservedly, have taken full responsibility and paid appropriate compensation. And to that, Prince Harry was awarded £140,600 the judge concluding his phone was hacked to a modest extent. But this wasn't about the money, it was about those responsible, including Piers Morgan. The judge said there can be no doubt he knew about phone hacking while at the mirror. I said all I'm going to say, I'm really sorry. He hit back bullishly. Prince Harry's outrage at media intrusion into the private lives of the royal family is only matched by his own ruthless, greedy and hypocritical enthusiasm for doing it himself. He talked today about the appalling behaviour of the press. But this is a guy who's repeatedly trashed his family in public for hundreds of millions of dollars, even as two of its most senior and respected members were dying, his grandparents. Harry hasn't always won public support, but today was a victory. This isn't just a win for Prince Harry. For him, it's outright vindication. The tone of his statement is striking, laying bare an absolute determination to take on the tabloids. Harry's not finished, with two more tabloid cases to come. For now, though, the headlines about him, something he will want to read. Laura Bundock, Sky News. And well, let's speak to another of those who experienced phone hacking at the hands of Mirror Group newspapers. He's also, of course, a campaigner against press intrusion, uh, the actor and comedian Steve Coogan. Steve, great to have you on the programme this evening. Um, Prince Harry has described this as a, as, a, as a great day for truth. What are your reflections? 
Um, well, it's uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, let's just remind ourselves of what the judge said. Uh, there could be no doubt, therefore, that the editors of the newspapers knew about voicemail interception and unlawful information gathering. Um, and he names Piers Morgan, Richard Wallace, uh, David Mirror, Neil Wallace, Mark Thomas, Lloyd and made Tina Weaver in the, in the mirror. So what we know is that uh, uh, Piers Morgan um, effectively, uh, the judge is saying, um, told an untruth. Um, what Piers Morgan said before Leveson was, I was not aware of any private investigations instructed by the Daily Mirror during my time as editor, uh, and having been uh, found to have engaged in any criminal activity on behalf of the Daily Mirror or of any Daily Mirror employee having the involvement in such law breaking. Well, um, that's not what the judge said today, what uh, Lord Bancroft said. He said that Piers Morgan did know about the illegal activity that was going on. And interestingly, Piers Morgan's statement today, he was very careful in the words he chose. He didn't say he had no knowledge. He said, I didn't hack anyone's phone. I didn't tell anyone to hack anyone's phone. Well, that's not what the judge is even accusing him of. So he's pussyfooting around it. The judge said, you had knowledge of what was going on. And Piers Morgan has said before Leveson, I didn't have any knowledge of what was going on. So he's changed his story because he knows he's in trouble. Um, what he effectively said was uh, completely contradicts uh, what the judge said today. He knew about it, yet he told, told Lord Leveson that he didn't know about it under oath at a public inquiry, along Which with was. a number of other newspaper editors. There's a word for yeah. that. It's perjury. This was, this, was, this, this was going to be my point. I mean, if he has lied under oath, either there or, or, or on any other occasion where, where, he is, where he has taken it, it is a very clear prima facie case of, of perjury. But, but I, I suppose... I mean, the question has always been, hasn't it, about Piers Morgan, that even if he did not know what was going on, and of course the judge in today's case at the Royal Courts of Justice has, has disagreed with that, but even if he did not know, then as editor of the newspaper, he has responsibility for ensuring that the stories that he is publishing during his tenure are, are, are sourced in a, a proper manner. Yes, the, 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 the point is that uh, he's, he's not, today, he's not denied that he didn't know what was going on, mm. and because he knows that that would, would uh, reinforce the lie that he told to Leveson. Um, you, as a newspaper editor, you can quite easily receive information from journalists who you know have gathered the information legally and, give, and, and, give, and they give it to you and you use it and you publish it. You can still say, I didn't hack anyone's phone. I didn't instruct anyone to hack anyone's phone. So he's not even denying it at this stage. Now, I what hope... What should happen then, Steve? So what should happen well, to Piers Morgan the police, is the police investigation the police, that Harry's police, talking about the, the way forward? Yeah. Well, the police should look at uh, what is quite obvious, clear uh, clear evidence of criminality. And I hope the police investigate it with, uh, uh, without fear or favour um, in, in, a, in a fair and open way and apply the law evenly and fairly uh, to these people as they would to any other member of the public. If a, a crime is taking place, they should investigate it. Let's see if they do. What is your view of the way in which Fleet Street is operating now? Of course, you know, there's no one on Fleet Street, but the, the, the tabloid press in particular. I mean, have have changes been made to the way in which they operate? As of course, the the the, the owners and kind of corporate corporate leadership well, of these organs would suggest that it has. Well, um, I think uh, first of all, uh, Richard Wallace, interesting, whose name is also now Piers Morgan's boss at, uh, at Talk TV. He needs to fire Piers Morgan for perjury. Uh, but the problem is he'd have to fire himself for perjury as well. So I, I can't see that happening. Um, but the problem is this. The press uh, dodged Leveson uh, with the collusion of uh, the government, who needs to keep the press on their side, so it's sort of cosy cartel of behaviour. What needs to happen is, uh, I mean, the thing is, at the moment, the press set up an organisation called uh, uh, Ipso, so they said, we don't need uh, any kind of legislation. We can govern ourselves. Well, if the press and these leading editors are prepared to lie under oath, then how can we believe anything they say in their self-governing uh, body uh, of IPSO, where they're supposed to govern themselves and hold themselves accountable for any transgressions? I mean, you've obviously been a, a supporter of the Hacked Off campaign for, for a long, long time now, Steve. Just in terms of, of the, the level of regulation that you think that, that, that the press deserves on the basis of what we've heard today and what we've heard in the past, your own case and, and the cases of so many others. I mean, it, it, is there any way around statutory regulation in your, in your mind? Well, st statutory regulation, um, you know, uh, uh, um, the, 
ex-editor of The Times, um, uh, Harold Evans, uh, said that the press's caricature of Everson's findings was, was, uh, was, was, a, was a gross caricature and was very misleading. Uh, the findings of Leveson uh, set out to protect public interest journalism at the same time as giving a form of redress for innocent victims of press intrusion. But the press didn't car 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 characterize it that way. They portrayed it as an, a, an attack on uh, freedom of speech. Clearly that's vacuous because if they were really interested in freedom of speech, they'd also be bothered about the fact that the newspapers are owned by about five billionaires um, who can basically dictate what is put in their newspapers. Um, but that doesn't bother them at all because those people pay their wages. And what, what are your thoughts this evening then, Steve, on, on, on Prince Harry himself? Not simply the, the battle that, 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 that he has gone through or indeed his experiences at the, hand of the hands of the press in this country and, and in the United States, but, but the role that he is playing, because of course, it's not just Mirror Group newspapers, is it? The Sun, the Mail, you know, this, this course could have some, this case, I should say, could have some, some pretty significant uh, repercussions uh, for the entire yeah. industry. I think I'm not a royalist, but I have great admiration for Prince Harry for not entering into the Faustian pact that the royal family had entered into before uh, with the tabloid press. He, he broke that and uh, it was a very bold, brave thing to do. Um, so uh, and I think there will be there will be repercussions. Um, you know, we, we want a, a, an accountable press that's publicly accountable. Um, the, the government, uh, and by the way, Leveson didn't, uh, did not want any government involvement. It was supposed to be an independent press regulation, independent of government and independent of the newspapers. We don't have that now. We have a press regulatory board, which is a sham, which is called IPSO, and it's run by the press and it protects themselves. And, and it's just, it's window dressing. Steve Coogan, great to talk to you this evening. Really appreciate your time. Now, specialist divers looking for a missing mother of three have found a woman's body in the River Wensum in Norwich. Gaynor Lord was last seen in the city centre a week ago when she'd left work early. Sky's Martin Brunt reports now from Norwich. Uh, By midday, the police search focused on a new and precise part of the river. A small orange boy marked the spot. First, sonar equipment was used to scan the area. It established what appeared to be a body. Then a single diver was sent down into the swollen waters. He spent a few minutes submerged before confirming the tragic discovery. Today, police specialist divers have found the body of a female in the River Wensum after a detailed and methodical search over the past few days. Whilst we establish her identity, our thoughts are with Gaynor's family at this difficult and distressing time. Mother of three, Gaynor Lord, vanished on Friday afternoon a week ago. She left work early. CCTV caught her journey through Norwich city centre. At times, she appears in a hurry. At one point, she dodges her way through moving traffic. She spent half an hour in the grounds of Norwich Cathedral, but police have no evidence she met anyone. The last sighting showed her heading to Wensum Park, where her phone, coat and other items were found. The body was discovered in the river, about 300 yards from where police think Gaynor went into the water. They don't believe she was the victim of a crime. As the tragic news spread through the city, sympathisers brought flowers to the park gates. I followed the story constantly since it broke on Friday and prayed with everything that she would, you know, hopefully be found safe and well. After initial forensic tests, the body was taken away for closer examination. Police still need to confirm the cause of death. There'll be a post-mortem examination in coming days and they will continue to try to establish what it was that drove Gaynor to disappear in the first place. Police were supporting Gaynor's husband and children whose worst fears have been realised. Martin Brunt, Sky News, Norwich. The British boy, found in France after being missing for six years, is expected to return to the UK this weekend. Alex Batty, who's originally from Oldham, was just 11 when he disappeared with his mother and grandfather during a family holiday to Spain in 2017. French prosecutors have said today that Alex decided to leave his spiritual community after his mother wanted to move everyone to Finland. 
as Sky's Adam Parsons reports. On this isolated stretch of road, Alex Batty's life changed. This is where he was found, walking through the rain in the middle of the night, six years after he disappeared. Alex, pictured here at the age of 11, says he was taken to a series of communes with limited access to the outside world. They would travel house to house with solar panels. They only used car sharing and they didn't have their own vehicle, always in places with large houses where there were many families with around 10 people, coming and going, never the same people. Alex said he was taken to Morocco, Spain, and then here to France. He told authorities his grandfather died six months ago, but said the final straw was when his mother told him she wanted to move again. His mother indicated he was going to leave with him to Finland. This young man understood that this needed to stop, so he decided to leave where he was with his mother and walked for four days and four nights. He was just walking at night and sleeping during the day. Alex was found by this man, Fabian Acidini. Last night, he told Sky News that Alex told him he just wanted to get home to his grandmother. So Fabian took him to this police station in the town of Revel, 30 miles from Toulouse, where Alex, exhausted, fell asleep on the floor. In a statement, his grandmother, Susan Caruana, who is Alex's legal guardian, said, I cannot begin to express my relief and happiness that Alex has been found safe and well. I spoke to him last night and it was so good to hear his voice and see his face again. Six years after his disappearance, Alex Batty decided to leave his mother behind and trekked for four days to end up here in the middle of the night, in the pouring rain, clutching a skateboard. And this is where he was rescued. Now, on the one hand, this is a tale of endurance and fortitude with a happy reunion to come. But it's also one about estrangement and fear. The whereabouts of Alex's mother are still unknown. That investigation will come, but the next step will be Alex's return to Oldham tomorrow. Adam Parsons, Sky News, South West France. Uh, coming up next, this Friday night, our news reviewers, John McGuire and Paul Nagley, return to help us with our regular feature, Good Week, Bad Week. Uh, starting with, well, the former minister, turned crime-fighting hero, David Davis, lauded for coming to the rescue of a complete stranger. But what of the climate change minister who flew thousands of miles for a five-minute vote? And landing a big fish for a champagne finish, we will be giving some love to the World Darts Championship in the sports news with Teddy Drake. All that after this. It's actually based on a family tradition that my mom did for us when we were growing up. And so when I was very, very young, I don't remember a Christmas without our elf. We would wake up every morning from the U.S. Thanksgiving through Christmas Day and our elf had gone to Santa Claus, provided a report and was back in our home in a new spot every morning. And so we would race out of bed to go find our elf. His name was Fisby. And it truly was the most magical way to experience the season. And so many, many years later, my sister and I wanted to share our tradition with the world. And that's how the Elf on the Shelf was born. Elves fly back and forth to Santa, as you might imagine. And so they really have individual personalities. So if your family is really creative, you have a lot going on, your Elf will probably be creative too. And if you're more of a laid back family, the Elf usually takes on that personality of your family. So you name the elf, it gets its magic, and then it's going to be off to the races. There are so many fun things that elves do. Sometimes they're pretty chill. They just, you know, hang out at the house and watch and report, which is a big deal. And other times you're going to see all manner of creativity. Sometimes they like to get in the cereal box. They tend to like the bathroom for some reason. I'm not sure what that's about, but it tends to be very popular. Once you read the book, you will understand the entire tradition in its entirety. So everything from you can't touch the elf or it could lose its magic, 
all the way through the tradition. It really is about families spending time together and enjoying the magic of the season. And while there are imposter elves out there pretending to be the actual true elf on the shelf, the magical elf from Santa, it truly is a way for wonder and magic and holiday beauty to come into focus. Uh, welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Uh, and of course, continuing our review of the week's news. It is at this point in the show we ask who has had a good week and who has had a bad one. The weekend is here, so who is relieved it's all over? Me. Uh, and who has finished a winner? Uh, still with us, the comedian and writer, Gronya Maguire, and Paul McNamee, editor of The Big Issue. Um, and I, I think we're going to start with you, Paul, aren't we? In terms of a good week, uh, Neanderthals have had a good week. Explain this one for me. I love this story. <laughs> um, it turns out that Neanderthals are helping us get up earlier. How exactly? I'm glad you ask. <laughs> it, it seems that quite a number of years ago when Homo sapiens were moving from Africa into Eurasia, they encountered Neanderthals mm -hmm. who had been living in the, the northern reaches for quite some time and who had become adapted to shorter days. Mm -hmm. And because they were adapted to shorter days, apparently it meant that they got up earlier to make the most of the day, as you would, as, as you a would, Neanderthal. Um, and then when there was a little bit of um, interbreeding between Homo sapiens and mm -hmm. Neanderthal, some of that DNA came to us. So if, for instance, you are one, an early riser, mm -hmm. that's down to your Neanderthal ancestors who are helping you who face the day. Just to be absolutely clear what you are saying here, Paul, if, for example, one was to host a breakfast news programme, yes. you are suggesting that because they get up early in the morning, they would be a Neanderthal. See, I am very conscious that this has been... She might be watching, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't... Maybe that person, <laughs> while they are hosting an early morning show, finds it very, very <laughs> tough. Therefore, they don't necessarily have <laughs> Neanderthal DNA. No. Yeah, sorry, I was just slightly taken by the full frontal shot of a Neanderthal. Uh, that we showed. There was nothing we could say. But do you know what? We're going to move on. Uh, Gronje, your selection um, for Good Week this time, uh, Greta Gerwig. Why do you, Gronje, want to talk about Greta Gerwig as having a good week? Well, it's just so brilliant. So she's going to be chair of the Cannes Film Festival mm -hmm. next year. And I just think it's such brilliant news because uh, historically female film directors have been overlooked. Mm -hmm. I mean, Barbara Streisand didn't even get an Oscar nomination for Nick Yentl. I mean, that we live to see it. Mm -hmm. And so it's great to see somebody, not only a female director, but somebody whose biggest hit was a comedy, which again, is not doesn't tend to be taken as seriously by film critics, being given this, um, being rewarded with this throne in the biggest film festival. I, I mean, I realise that both of you have dressed down for the occasion, this being Christmas and all the rest of it, but are you a fan of Pink? Gronya, are you a, are you a secret Barbie fan? Because of course that that our greatest hit. I've yet to see it. Strangely enough. Oh, listen, just treat yourself. You need mm. to love yourself more. Take yourself to see Barbie because I went to see it this year, as did every woman and fan of cinema, and it was <laughs> it was just so good. It was just so great because. Oftentimes, like the feminine, you know, people kind of sneer at and it's seen as something like slightly embarrassed, embarrassing. Mm. But it was great. It was like, I felt like, is this what it's like being a football fan? Like all these women <laughs> taking over the streets, all in pink, all saying, hey, Barbie, to each other. And it was such a celebration. It was a fantastic night out. So it's brilliant to see her not only being rewarded financially at the box office, mm. but also critically by being embraced at this prestigious film festival. You a big Barbie fan? I haven't seen Barbie yet. It, it's a big film in my house. My wife and my daughter have seen it a few times and, and talk about it in growing terms, as do you. I am still stung by the accusation that we're dressing down. 
Yeah. <laughs> so sorry. I, I was I'm like, so do sorry. we move on from yeah. that? Yeah. Or... Isn't that isn't, that's something, isn't it? Oh, this it's is like Marks and Spencer. It's, the, it's the, the fact that the only flash of colour on the sofa is coming from your socks right now, Paul. And, of course, they had to be green. Um, but do you know what? My choice uh, for Good Week is uh, one David Davis MP, 74-year-old, former SAS reservist, who actually are not very far away from where we are sitting right now, literally on the street just outside, took on two guys who were punching a homeless man. Um, he got involved, and more than that, he didn't just intervene and stop them from, from beating him up. He, he, he took him home for the evening, gave him, gave, gave, made sure he was OK, had him sleep on his sofa for the night. I, I mean, fair play to David Davis, 74 years old, and he's taking two people on. I, I, I have to admit, I'd, I'd probably have a go, but I don't think I'd be as successful as he was. I think it's a remarkable thing to do. I mean, there, there's a few parts to this. One, you, you would like to think that if you saw something like that, whether mm. it's somebody who is homeless or just somebody on the street who has been set upon by people, that you would do something, whether it, you, you'd intervene and, and fight or just say something. And we don't know if we would, but the fact that he did it and the fact that he went further, that he, he then tried to help that person that night, just in the moment, have a better time in their life I think says a lot about him because again, that is a that is a bold step to take. Now, homelessness is is chronic and uh, a human human humanitarian disaster in so many cities in Britain at the moment, and you can't take every single person into your home. But so I, I applaud David Davis for doing that. Well, well, this 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 allows us to segue very naturally onto to your to your bad week, Paul, which is of course the homeless. I mean, and and at this time of year, when the weather is cold when you just see, you see, you're seeing people wandering through the streets with bags full of presents, and yeah, it, it must be, well, it's grim at the best of times. It must be absolutely horrific right now. Yes, and the, the statistics this week said that, that it, it, um, homelessness in England is up 14% year wow. on year, which is a staggering volume of people. And on top of that, there are 130,000 kids in non-permanent accommodation, whether that's in in hostels or B and Bs or, or 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 staying somewhere just to get some respite, which is a shameful indictment on, on on the nation that we are in at the moment. But you're right. The particularly for the big issue, we see it that when people are out, they're a little more inclined to engage with people selling mm -hmm. the big issue at this time of year, which is beneficial. It means that those who are selling it and who are making a living doing it can get more money in. But it's also it. It is sad that it, it takes this kind of time of year so that there's that extra guilt aspect that is, that is driving that. I, I would like it that, A, we didn't need to have the big issue and B, that we didn't need to have this Christmas surge to help people. I think I'm with you on that one. Um, Gronje, your bad week selection. The business secretary, Kemi Badenoch, what's she been up to? Well, listen, I love a messy queen. I love a messy queen and Kemi is my favourite agent of chaos. Right, go on. She, you just never know what she's going to say. You'd never know what angle she's going to take. And she it was beautiful. So this week she's taken on science. Um, <laughs> uh, she's taking on archaeologists and uh, time t the time team, basically. Right, so, go on, explain this one. The uh, time team. <laughs> she's Tony on Robinson, <laughs> dear goodness, poor lad. What's happening? It's so, um, an, a... a um, a paper came out mm -hmm. about the, the London plague and they discovered from this plague pit that historically uh, people of colour were disproportionately represented in this plague pit than uh, white people and it just showed that, you know, throughout all sort of um, health emergencies, uh -huh. the people of colour tend to be disproportionately affected, even medieval times. I think I see where you're going here. It was the word woke perhaps <laughs> used in conjunction with uh, archaeology. Listen, uh, 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 not on Kemi Badenoch's watch. <laughs> not on Kemi Badenoch. She was, she was, she was offended. Mm. She didn't like science. She didn't like these results. And you know, like I'm your typical lefty liberal person. So I know gesture politics when I see gesture <laughs> politics. So touche, Kemi. Well, just, well work. just on just on on that particular po topic of gesture politics, uh, my choice uh, for bad week, uh, Graham Airmiles Stewart, the climate change minister, who flew from the COP summit in Dubai to vote on the Rwanda issue in Westminster, and then of course went straight back to Dubai, the climate change summit. I mean, 
Uh, should we just all stare blankly at the camera for 30 seconds rather than providing a, a response to this? <laughs> I mean, it's just daft, isn't it? I, I mean, I'm sorry, some days I, I, do, I do genuinely think that, you know, that I've been taking crazy pills. But you, you, you speak as if this government, the end days of this government, has, every day does not throw up instances like this. And I also hope that somebody watching can get into the Wikipedia page and make Air Miles uh, <laughs> <laughs> its official name. Just all I would say is, do nothing illegal. Do nothing illegal <laughs> on our behalf. Uh, Gronya Paul, you can uh, stay right where you are. We're going to have a little bit more time with you uh, after the break. Uh, but after the break, looking forward to this one. Uh, one of the original members of Slade will be joining us as the old classics outsell new tunes on the Christmas charts. Welcome back. In the words of Naughty Holder, does your granny always tell you that the old songs are the best? Uh, well, this week's charts, in fact, prove them right. The top 10 is currently dominated by classic Christmas songs. And tonight, at number seven, Rocking Around the Christmas Tree by Brenda Lee, which was recorded 65 years ago. Uh, well, one person who knows more than most about Christmas classics is Don Powell, playing the drums for Slade for more than 50 years since their yeah. iconic festive number one, Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, Don, great to have you on the show this evening. Um, to, to what do we, to be to, here, mate. 
So to what do we attribute this? Is it just the fact that musicians nowadays just aren't as good as you guys at putting together a Christmas hit? Um, I don't know, because when we recorded our Christmas, we were on the crest of a wave anyway that year, 1973, and it was Jim Lee's uh, mother-in-law who sort of instigated the uh, the idea. She mentioned to Jim Lee that you should uh, write a Christmas song, and that's where it came from. And Jim Lee put the idea forward. And would you believe we were on a world tour at the time, and we were in New York in the summer of '73, and there it was. It was a hundred degrees heat wave, and there we were singing "Merry Christmas." And at the time, it it didn't really seem conducive it had been a hundred degrees heat wave and us singing about Merry Christmas. <laughs> are you are you is that not even a tiny the tiniest part of you, Don? There's this maybe a bit sick of it by now. No, never. Never get sick of it. it it's great. I mean, um, it's just a, a great fun record. And um, we had a great time recording it. I mean, it's sort of thing. Like I said, it was a bit strange because it was a heat wave in New York. And, and at first, we weren't sure about releasing it. And it was our record producer at the time, Chas Chandler, said, I don't care what you lot say, this is coming out. <laughs> OK, so, so to put you on the spot then, Don, obviously, Merry Christmas, Everybody is the greatest uh, Christmas record ever made. Uh, what else do you like at this time of year? You can't, name, you can't use carols, you can't use hymns. I'm looking for pop songs that you think hit the mark in terms of uh, Christmas music. I, I um, well, personally, I, I really like Roy Wood's version. I yeah. wish it could be Christmas every day. That, that's, a, that's a great song. But I remember that particular year, 1973, there was a glut of Christmas records. There was uh, Greg Lake, uh, Elton John. There's quite a few records out that year. But uh, we, we picked them all at the post. But we, we were having a, a great year that year anyway. But... Uh, there's, there's so many great Christmas records out, you know. It, it's fantastic, really. I think I think it just lifts everybody's uh, dismal beings, if you like, when people sort of feel a bit depressed and you can play these Christmas records and, and they really do lift you up. I, will, I just want to play perhaps my, my number two, uh, Don. My number two is, is By the Darkness. Another kind of group of rockers just like yourselves. I wonder, I just want to play it and I want to get your view on it. They've encountered this one at some point over the years, Don. But again, it's, you know, big guitars, lots of singing, everyone having a great time and a bit of fun as well. Exactly. That's what it's all about, isn't it, really? I mean, that, they, this time of year, it, it's just... We're, we're not out to preach a message, we're just out to sort of lift everybody's spirits up. Mm. Uh, Don, just stay where you are. I just want to bring in the panel at this point, Gronje and Paul. I mean, for, for you guys, Christmas records, you know, obviously Slade has to be at the top of the list. Any others that you guys particularly like? We were talking in the break about this, and it was almost the fact that you can... All you need to do to make a Christmas record is stick some jingle bells on the top of it. But as Slade's obviously sure, that's that's certainly not the case. I love a little bit of Feliz Navidad. I start shaking my hips like I'm... Sorry, to what? The, am, I, am, I, am I singing live on it? <laughs> Feliz Navidad. <laughs> I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Please tell me other people have heard this I, song. It's, it's a very well-known song and very, very well performed. <laughs> Uh, any particular favourites for you, Paul? Well, I do. I, I love Merry Christmas, everybody, and I, I never tire of it. Mm. But Fairy Tale of New York it is yeah. hard to get beyond that. Uh, and I, I also annoy my family by playing in the bleak midwinter quite a lot, mm. just to temper their, their enthusiasm. Oh, uh, Don, I, I, I wonder if part, part of the problem with the, the new records that are getting into the charts or, or, or not getting into the charts is that, that music these days just it's just perhaps just a little bit more ephemeral, that it's actually quite difficult to write a Christmas hit, unless, of course, your name is Lad Baby. Uh, you still with us, Don? Are you there? I can hear you now. That's right, yeah. 
I'm yeah, sorry, still... I was just saying, it's, it's, it's part of the problem. It's part of the reason that these oldies keep coming back into the charts and we're just looking at the pogues there, of course, is that the music nowadays is just a bit more ephemeral, that it's a bit... It, it, it isn't quite as solid, it isn't quite as tuneful, it doesn't persist as long in terms of an earworm as songs like your own. Well, I think... Uh... Well, I think really we were never out or out to preach a message there. We were just out to have a good time, and I think, and that was the same with a lot of the songs around that time in the seventies, early to mid seventies. That we weren't out to preach a message. We were just out to have a good time. Um, well done. Do you know what? Are you ready for Christmas yourself? I mean, surely, surely, there, there has to be a point in the day where the tune comes out. Uh, well, yeah, it's uh, yes, I get sort of stuck with it, especially I was in an elevator the one time and just playing in the elevator, and the elevator was quite packed, and I was at the front by the door, and this guy behind me, he didn't see me there. He just shouted, I'm so fed up with this record. And I, <laughs> I, and I turned around and faced him. You should have seen his face. He didn't know where to look. You know? <laughs> But, but well, it's fantastic. I mean, no matter where you go, it's there in, in the supermarket, like I said, in the elevator. It, it's great. It's great fun. Uh, well, Don, look, wishing you and yours a very, very Merry Christmas uh, when it comes. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks a lot, mate. Uh, and Gronje, Paul, it is time for us to say goodbye to you as well. Uh, thank you so much for your input. We will see you in 2024. Yeah, have a Merry Christmas when it comes. Uh, coming up next in the sport, though, is it the greatest comeback since Lazarus? We'll be giving some love to the World Darts Championship and giving a new nickname to our sports presenter, Teddy Tunnock Draper. I'm Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soa murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Come on. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News, at the Old Bailey. Uh, welcome back to Friday Night uh, with me, Neil Patterson. You can tell it's nearly Christmas. The darts is back on the telly. Uh, let's bring in Sky Sports News' Teddy Draper. And, Teddy, we have had to give you a darts nickname. Uh, Teddy Tunup Draper. I mean, are you, are, you as, are you as big a fan of the arrows, the magic darts, as I am? Because I have to admit, 
I go all the way back to Lakeside. That was where my fascination with it started. But it's now it's it's so glitzy, so glam. It's it's a, it's a country mile away uh, from the sport it used to be. Yeah, Alexandra Palace is an epic event, isn't it? I'm a fan of the, it's an event, I suppose. I'm not an aficionado of the, the, the technicalities of it. Obviously, hugely, I suppose, admirable or admirer of the big stars of it. Phil La Power Taylor, 14 times champion. But I suppose it's much more than that. I've got friends that go every year to Ali Pali and couldn't really tell you the results, but have a fantastic time <laughs> regardless. The, the, the beer's flowing tonight on the, the, the opening night already, and I've seen some Teletubbies uh, making their way in and various people in, in, in fascinating outfits. And there's judges there with the full-on wig. So there's a lot of people. Here we go. These are pictures, I believe, from last year. So <laughs> got some, uh, some sombreros and some uh, Mexicans out there, allegedly. Uh, but some, some wonderful scenes every year. And I think, you know, beneath this, there is the, the fascinating skill development. So the PDC, there is a BDO Darts Championship. But I think the Professional Darts Championship, powered by Phil the Power Taylor, has certainly caught the eye. And it was an epic final last year. Michael Bullyboy Smith, who actually... He's going to be the headline event a little bit later tonight, defending his title. And he says he's had some great nights out on the back of uh, not only winning that money last year, but also the prestige. I, I, I suppose the thing about the darts that has always grabbed me, and as I say, I, 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 as a junior reporter, junior political reporter, I had to trot all the way down to Lakeside to interview some random education minister and Martin Wolfie Adams, then captain of England, um, because they were launching a campaign about numeracy. It is an easy, it's an easy game for people to pick up. And as a spectator sport, I have to admit, I never quite understood it when it was at Lakeside. Now that it's at Ali Pali, where the alcohol does flow pretty f freely, admittedly. I mean, it's, it's, you can't help but get caught up in it. It's a spectacle. And I'm not sure how many sports there are out there who can create, generate such a spectacle from, from essentially two large lads flinging darts in a board. <laughs> Yeah, I remember having a conversation actually with Barry Hearn at a boxing event, but I think it was uh, Ali Pali was happening at the same time, and he was raving about all the the income that was flowing through the, the bars at that time and the pre the event. So I think Matchroom's done a fantastic job in building up the PDC with Sky Sports. You've got the iconic music, haven't you? As well, the flashing lights. You've got the kind of almost boxing style ring walks when the the guys bounce out. You know, Peter Snake Snake uh, Bite Wright comes out with his mohawk, and he's a two-time champion. He'll be one of the favourites this time around. They've all got great nicknames here. Gary Anderson the Flying Scotsman so there's a real sense of occasion and event to it but I think with Phil the Power Taylor setting that standard the actual skill level is, is pretty ridiculously high now we're still waiting for someone since Phil the Power Taylor won his last title 10 years ago same year that, that Manchester United won their last title he's still waiting for someone to surpass him in terms of or equal him we thought Michael Van Gogh would be the next huge star three time champion he's been to a couple of finals since last wing it in 2019 but I feel like it's, it's up in the air and maybe that adds another level of intrigue to it it's such a competitive sport now as well we're not quite sure who's going to go all the way this time around but we know it's going to be fantastic entertainment en route uh, Teddy, we've got 15 seconds, so of course I've got to ask you, how would you do a 170 checkout? How would I do it? Uh, I think over about three weeks, probably, <laughs> 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 judging by my university days when we played, we played killer. So I think I'd take it slow and probably have a, a couple of ones and singles in there. I think treble 20 would be a long stretch for me. Yeah, two, two treble 20s and a 50. It's quite simple. We'll let you get on with the bulletin. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Well, Stuart, it's been a few months now since the end of what was an incredible Ashes series. How are you adjusting now to life after playing cricket? Yeah, really enjoying it. You know, I think ultimately finishing on my own terms was really important for me and I knew that I wanted to finish um, bowl my last ball playing for England. Uh, England versus Australia was a, a major pinnacle for me in Ashes cricket and it was such an exciting and exhilarating series that I almost got to the stage where I don't know if it gets any better than this really. So yeah, that, it, was, it was great to be able to sort of make the decision on my own, finish on my own terms and um, I don't think it will really properly hit me until the test team play again and Jimmy Anderson and Ben Stokes are walking out with an England cap on in their whites, I think that might sort of feel real that I, I won't ever do that again. But you know, at the moment, I've got no regrets and, and feel really happy. In the book, you spoke about the fact that retirement only really came to you during the Old Trafford test. So you came to a massive decision quite quickly. Yeah, within 10 days, I think. So yeah, it was pretty stressful. You know, ultimately, anytime you walk away from something you love, 
it's really difficult and I was loving playing cricket, I was loving working under Stokesy and Baz, uh, it was great fun, I didn't feel much pressure, uh, the communication was really good and I was bowling really well and felt fit so a lot of those things would say carry on playing and I honestly felt like I could do another couple of years but I kept sort of bringing myself back to what's my next Everest, what's my next major challenge. I always need a challenge because I've got this goal to always continuously improve. I need something to charge towards and, and chase. And whenever I've written down in my whole career, what's my next Everest, bang, within 30 seconds I've written down and I know what to target. And I just couldn't quite nail something down. So I think that ultimately told me that it was the right time to, to move and, and try something different. The next Ash is two years away. Would that have felt too far when you were making that decision a few months ago? No, I think, I, I think I'd still be fit and fresh to play. Um, but I know that young, uh, a young family played a part as well. You know, uh, Annabelle is turning one, uh, the travels a lot in international cricket and the, the young years are so valuable. Ultimately, I'm 37, uh, next Ash is to be 39 and although I, I still feel like I'd be able to play I didn't want to sacrifice some sort of memories and special moments I could share with my family up until then and because you have to dedicate your life to, to playing for England you have to dedicate everything to it and um, you know I, I've done that for 17 years uh, and you know it's time to still feel very focused on a career but but spend a bit more time at home and you bowed out in magical circumstances last ball you hit for six Last ball you bowled was a wicket, 150 wickets. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Terry, thank you. We will see you late in the nine o'clock hour. For us, though, time for the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. And a prolonged spell of very heavy rain will affect northwest Scotland this weekend and could lead to flooding, landslides, travel disruption and power cuts. Already, though, it's a wetter and windier picture across northern and western parts of Scotland. Elsewhere, a cloudy evening with some spots of light rain or drizzle. Tonight's looking to be relatively mild and frost-free under a blanket of cloud with further outbreaks of rain in the northwest. A few clear spells are possible in the east. Uh, lots of he heavy, heavy rain uh, coming your way on Saturday, though. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in the nine o'clock hour, the Israel Defence Forces say they mistakenly killed three hostages during their Gaza operation.
coming up in the final hour of Friday night with me, Neil Patterson. Uh, we'll be giving the NHS a health check, going into the crucial winter period and taking a sneak peek at the big Christmas film, TV and gaming highlights. Uh, but first, the headlines this hour. And Israel has admitted killing three hostages being held by Hamas in a friendly fire incident in Gaza. Harry wins his hacking case against Mirror Group newspapers and calls for a police investigation following what he describes as his vindication. Police searching for missing mother of three, Gaynor Lord, discover a body in a nearby river. Relief and happiness. The grandmother of Alex Batty on speaking to the missing British boy and his imminent return home. Also this hour, our health correspondent Ashish Joshi joins me to discuss the health of the NHS with strikes, waiting lists and a winter crisis among the concerns. Uh, we'll also be previewing the big Christmas releases in the cinema on TV and what your kids will be playing on their consoles, uh, of course. Uh, Aquaman, uh, here we have Jason Momoa there, uh, paying a visit to old London town this week. Will he be the big hit of the festive period? Uh, and in the sports, I don't know what he's laughing about. Uh, Manchester United manager uh, Eric Ten Hag defends his side's woeful form ahead of this weekend's meeting with league leaders Liverpool. Great to have your company for the final hour of the show. All on tight, it's Friday night. Evening all. The Israel Defence Forces have tonight admitted killing three hostages being held by Hamas in a friendly fire attack in Gaza. Well, tonight, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, described the deaths as an unbearable tragedy. Meanwhile, a cameraman working for the news network Al Jazeera has also been killed after being caught in what's understood to have been an Israeli airstrike. Samar Abu Dhaka and his colleague, Wael Al Dadu, were reporting from a school turned shelter in the southern city of Khan Yunus. Uh, this report from our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle. Israel's bombardment of Gaza hasn't let up one bit. And the death toll of Hamas fighters and Palestinian civilians keeps rising daily. <laughs> Our team filmed in Al Nasa Hospital in Khan Yunus as the bodies of more dead arrive from another Israeli airstrike. <laughs> the grief and anger is uncontrollable. Bodies are put on the corridor floor. Space in the morgue ran out a long time ago. A man refuses to leave the bodies of his relatives. He lies on the floor and puts his arms around them. The F-16 jet threw a rocket weighing a ton at them. They were all innocent children. An Al Jazeera journalist, Wael Adadu, is being treated in the same hospital. He was injured by shrapnel from an airstrike as he filmed the aftermath of an attack on a school in Khan Yunis. His cameraman, Sama Abu Dhaka, was killed. For many in the Arab world, Al Dadur has been the face of coverage from Gaza during the war. His wife, daughter, son and grandson were killed in an airstrike a few weeks ago. <laughs> the Israeli military says it has launched its first major attack on Rafa in the south of Gaza. The area is right on the Egyptian border, and it is where thousands have fled to for safety. But Israel believes it is one of the last Hamas strongholds that they haven't properly targeted yet. The IDF released this video of their soldiers operating today. They've also announced that they accidentally killed three Israeli hostages during fighting in Gaza. They say it was mistaken identity. The dead hostages have been named as Yotam Haim, Samad Talalka and Alon Shamriz. During searches and checks in the area in which the incident occurred, a suspicion arose over the identities of the deceased. Their bodies were transferred to Israeli territory for examination, after which it was confirmed that they were three Israeli hostages. Tonight, for the first time in many weeks, Hamas fired rockets on Jerusalem. Despite the intense, months-long Israeli military operation, Hamas was showing it is still able to fight. 
Israel has not eliminated it yet. And this will be proof for Israeli leaders why the war cannot end now. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News in Jerusalem. Uh, joining us now, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus, spokesman uh, for the Israel Defence Forces. Colonel, great to have you with us this evening. And, and I'm sure you know where we would wish to start. The, the, the very sad news uh, that those three Israeli hostages being held by Hamas uh, have been killed and, and killed in, in what the IDF is, is describing, perhaps not using these words, but describing as, a, as an incident of friendly fire. What more can you tell us? Yes, a sad evening. Thank you for having me on the program. Uh, what we know so far, and of course we are investigating this event, and we will investigate it thoroughly and be fully transparent with the families of the bereaved. And I want to take this opportunity to express our deepest condolences to the families uh, of these Israeli hostages. What we know so far is that there was fighting on the ground uh, in Sajaiya, northern Gaza, between Israeli troops and Hamas terrorists. Uh, after the fighting, the first stage of the fighting, our troops saw a, a group of men approaching. They perceived a threat, and as a result of that, engaged, uh, opened fire, and shortly after, uh, understood that uh, something needed to be verified, and the bodies were taken, uh, and they were then transported back into Israel to be uh, uh, assessed, and it became apparent that there were indeed Israeli uh, hostages that were above ground, dressed in civilian clothes, and were walking towards our troops. Now, what makes this such a tragic incident, and again, we, we, we have to make sure that we learn the relevant lessons from what happened, uh, we have already disseminated guidelines for our troops on the ground to make sure that uh, we minimize the risks of this happening again in any other location in Gaza. Uh, because you see, it, it wouldn't be abnormal. I'm sorry if the uh, connection is uh, choppy. I apologize for that. Uh, it wouldn't be abnormal for uh, us to see combatants dressed in civilian clothes. Uh, you can see that on Hamas videos as well. They fight while dressed in civilian clothes, sadly. Sure, sure. Uh, and that, I think, is part of the uh, confusion here that led to this very tragic and uh, sad mistake. I mean, in, in a roundabout fashion, I suppose one might suggest that, that, that this has not happened before now. It is perhaps it is perhaps surprising. From, from what you've been suggesting, though, Colonel, and you're obviously providing more advice to those troops who are operating in Gaza at the moment, are you are, are you saying that you are going to change the way in which uh, your soldiers are, are, are operating on the ground when it comes to circumstances like this? I mean, I, I'm, I'm wondering how that might be possible. Yes, of course, uh, we know that it's not only the British public listening to what we're saying here, but that uh, Hamas will also likely listen in with great interest. So for obvious reasons, I'm not going to go into details what and how we're going to change. I can only say that we have issued guidelines and clarifications for troops on the ground, how to prevent the likelihood of this happening again. I'm not sure, unfortunately, that we will be able to be 100% perfect in the future either and we will face difficult situations and combat dilemmas. Uh, it is a very chaotic environment on the ground that our forces are uh, in, uh, where the enemy uses everything civilian in order to uh, fight against us. And all of the fighting that Hamas conducts is conducted from civilian areas using schools, hospitals, mosques, and everything that you are now showing on the screen. It is ruined because there was fighting there and because Hamas made an, a, a decision to fight against us using those uh, that uh, civilian infrastructure. And that is the reason why sure. what we're seeing on the screen now. Um, I, I have to ask you, as indeed we asked Mark Regev on the programme last week, about the manner in which Israel is, is prosecuting this war. There is a degree of criticism coming, not simply from an international community uh, that at the General Assembly of the United Nations voted overwhelmingly uh, to allow a ceasefire to take place, but, but from your allies, the UK's ambassador to the United Nations describing the, the civilian death toll as shocking. Joe Biden, the US president, referring to, to your tactics in Gaza as, as indiscriminate bombing. Does that give you pause for thought about the manner in which your colleagues in the IDF are, 
are conducting themselves? Well, of course, we listen to what uh, leaders and senior officials in democratic countries have to say, their opinions and their concerns. Uh, it's important, and I think that there's a very uh, professional and candid dialogue between said elected uh, officials or senior people. Uh, and sure, there is but it's, it's, the pres it's the president of the United States talking about your tactics as indiscriminate bombing. I, I gently suggest that, I, that I, perhaps I, suggests a, a changing in the, the, the tide of public opinion amongst Western allies and their leaders. Yeah, I think that he said Israel needs to be careful not to be perceived as uh, indiscriminately bombing, but the the word was there, so let's uh, we we can uh, we can use that as a talking point. Uh, I think that we are very very careful when it comes to uh, attacking and what type of uh, munitions we use, and it really has to be understood that we are fighting in an environment that is extremely challenging, where the enemy is. Actually, his whole part of his whole strategy is exactly for this conversation to be held, to be speaking about civilian casualties so that they can plead for a ceasefire and live another day and plan another October 7 attack until they're able to wage a complete jihad against Israel. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of senior Hamas officials, Ghazi Hamed and uh, other Mustafa Abu Marzouk, who have said so very clearly that this is what they intend to do. And for once, I think we are now listening to what they're saying, and we are, we are very much inclined not to allow that to happen. Last thing I'll say, there are still more than 250,000 Israelis that have been forced out of their homes and cannot yet return to their homes because it is not safe, because Hamas still exists. And it is our duty to make sure that Hamas is dismantled so that our civilians can go back to their homes. They will do that, and we will bring back all of our hostages. Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus, thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Now, a great day for truth, Prince Harry's reaction after winning 15 claims against Mirror Group newspapers of unlawfully gathering information for stories published about him. Uh, with the Prince absent from court, it was left to his lawyer, David Sharbon KC, to read out a statement on Harry's behalf, calling the ruling vindicating and affirming. He was also awarded more than £140,000 in damages. Our Royal Correspondent, Laura Bundock, reports on a landmark day at the Royal Courts of Justice. Just a warning, her report does contain flash photography throughout. In his fight with Fleet Street, it's round one to Prince Harry. A judge ruling he is the victim of hacking and blagging, obtaining information by deceit. Not only that, but senior staff at Mirror Group knew about it and turned a blind eye. Read by his barrister, Harry's statement said it all. Today's ruling is vindicating and affirming. I've been told that slaying dragons will get you burned. But in light of today's victory and the importance of what is doing what is needed for a free and honest press, it is a worthwhile price to pay. The mission continues. The judgment said there was extensive phone hacking at Mirror Group Papers. It considered 33 articles about Prince Harry and ruled 15 of them were written using information unlawfully obtained. Mirror Group said nothing, none of those articles was illegal. Zero, zilch, nada. But in fact, half of them were. And if you extend that to the rest of the articles, that's going to be about 60 articles. That's a hell of a lot of unlawful activity that he's been able to prove, even though it was years ago and many of the documents have been destroyed. This ruling means over a hundred more claims could now be heard. In a statement, a Mirror Group spokesperson said, we welcome today's judgment that gives the business the necessary clarity to move forward from events that took place many years ago. Where historical wrongdoing took place, we apologise unreservedly, have taken full responsibility and paid appropriate compensation. And to that, Prince Harry was awarded £140,600. The judge concluding his phone was hacked to a modest extent. But this wasn't about the money, it was about those responsible, including Piers Morgan. The judge said there can be no doubt he knew about phone hacking while at the mirror. I said all I'm going to say. I'm really sorry. He hit back bullishly. 
Prince Harry's outrage at media intrusion into the private lives of the royal family is only matched by his own ruthless, greedy and hypocritical enthusiasm for doing it himself. He talked today about the appalling behaviour of the press. But this is a guy who's repeatedly trashed his family in public for hundreds of millions of dollars, even as two of its most senior and respected members were dying, his grandparents. Harry hasn't always won public support, but today was a victory. This isn't just a win for Prince Harry. For him, it's outright vindication. The tone of his statement is striking, laying bare an absolute determination to take on the tabloids. Harry's not finished, with two more tabloid cases to come. For now, though, the headlines about him, something he will want to read. Laura Bundock, Sky News. And I don't know why, but I just have a sneaky suspicion that that story might just feature in tomorrow's papers. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from half past ten this evening. Tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Uh, joining us this evening, the writer and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner and the political commentator Benedict Spence. Specialist divers looking for a missing mother of three have found a woman's body in the River Wensum in Norwich. Gaynor Lord was last seen in the city centre a week ago when she'd left work early. Sky's Martin Brunt reports now from Norwich. By midday, the police search focused on a new and precise part of the river. A small orange boy marked the spot. First, sonar equipment was used to scan the area. It established what appeared to be a body. Then a single diver was sent down into the swollen waters. He spent a few minutes submerged before confirming the tragic discovery. Today, police specialist divers have found the body of a female in the River Wensum after a detailed and methodical search over the past few days. Whilst we establish her identity, our thoughts are with Gaynor's family at this difficult and distressing time. Mother of three, Gaynor Lord, vanished on Friday afternoon a week ago. She left work early. CCTV caught her journey through Norwich city centre. At times, she appears in a hurry. At one point, she dodges her way through moving traffic. She spent half an hour in the grounds of Norwich Cathedral, but police have no evidence she met anyone. The last sighting showed her heading to Wensum Park, where her phone, coat and other items were found. The body was discovered in the river, about 300 yards from where police think Gaynor went into the water. They don't believe she was the victim of a crime. As the tragic news spread through the city, sympathisers brought flowers to the park gates. I followed the story constantly since it broke on Friday and prayed with everything that she would, you know, hopefully be found safe and well. After initial forensic tests, the body was taken away for closer examination. Police still need to confirm the cause of death. There'll be a post-mortem examination in coming days and they will continue to try to establish what it was that drove Gaynor to disappear in the first place. Police were supporting Gaynor's husband and children whose worst fears have been realised. Martin Brunt, Sky News, Norwich. The British boy found in France after being missing for six years is expected to return to the UK this weekend. Alex Batty, who's originally from Oldham, was just 11 when he disappeared with his mother and grandfather during a family holiday to Spain in 2017. French prosecutors said today that Alex decided to leave his spiritual community after his mother wanted to move everyone to Finland. Sky's Adam Parsons has the detail. On this isolated stretch of road, Alex Batty's life changed. This is where he was found, walking through the rain in the middle of the night, six years after he disappeared. Alex, pictured here at the age of 11, says he was taken to a series of communes with limited access to the outside world. They would travel house to house with solar panels. They only used car sharing and they didn't have their own vehicle, always in places with large houses where there were many families with around 10 people, coming and going, never the same people. 
Alex said he was taken to Morocco, Spain, and then here to France. He told authorities his grandfather died six months ago, but said the final straw was when his mother told him she wanted to move again. His mother indicated he was going to leave with him to Finland. This young man understood that this needed to stop, so he decided to leave where he was with his mother and walked for four days and four nights. He was just walking at night and sleeping during the day. Alex was found by this man, Fabian Acidini. Last night he told Sky News that Alex told him he just wanted to get home to his grandmother. So Fabian took him to this police station in the town of Revel, 30 miles from Toulouse, where Alex, exhausted, fell asleep on the floor. In a statement, his grandmother, Susan Caruana, who is Alex's legal guardian, said, I cannot begin to express my relief and happiness that Alex has been found safe and well. I spoke to him last night and it was so good to hear his voice and see his face again. Six years after his disappearance, Alex Batty decided to leave his mother behind and trekked for four days to end up here in the middle of the night, in the pouring rain, clutching a skateboard. And this is where he was rescued. Now, on the one hand, this is a tale of endurance and fortitude with a happy reunion to come. But it's also one about estrangement and fear. The whereabouts of Alex's mother are still unknown. That investigation will come, but the next step will be Alex's return to Oldham tomorrow. Adam Parsons, Sky News, South West France. Uh, coming up next here on Friday night, why festive strikes could add to the delays and waiting lists being experienced by NHS patients. We'll be talking about that with our health correspondent in just a sec. It's actually based on a family tradition that my mom did for us when we were growing up. And so when I was very, very young, I don't remember a Christmas without our elf. We would wake up every morning from the U.S. Thanksgiving through Christmas Day and our elf had gone to Santa Claus, provided a report and was back in our home in a new spot every morning. And so we would race out of bed to go find our elf. His name was Fisby. And it truly was the most magical way to experience the season. And so many, many years later, my sister and I wanted to share our tradition with the world. And that's how the Elf on the Shelf was born. Elves fly back and forth to Santa, as you might imagine. And so they really have individual personalities. So if your family is really creative, you have a lot going on, your Elf will probably be creative too. And if you're more of a laid back family, the Elf usually takes on that personality of your family. So you name the elf, it gets its magic, and then it's going to be off to the races. There are so many fun things that elves do. Sometimes they're pretty chill. They just, you know, hang out at the house and watch and report, which is a big deal. And other times you're going to see all manner of creativity. Sometimes they like to get in the cereal box. They tend to like the bathroom for some reason. I'm not sure what that's about, but it tends to be very popular. Once you read the book, you will understand the entire tradition in its entirety. So everything from you can't touch the elf or it could lose its magic all the way through the tradition. It really is about families spending time together and enjoying the magic of the season. And while there are imposter elves out there pretending to be the actual true elf on the shelf, the magical elf from Santa, it truly is a way for wonder and magic and holiday beauty to come into focus.
five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Welcome back. Uh, we have had a pretty decent insight into how the NHS in England is performing this week. The Health Service produced a series of figures which show just how they're coping as hospitals prepare for not one, but two major strikes during the festive period. Uh, there is some good news, though. There has been a slight fall in the number of people waiting for routine treatment. But brace for the bad news. Junior doctors are ramping up their strike action and will be walking out both at Christmas and New Year. Uh, let's bring in someone who knows an awful lot more about this than I, our, uh, our health correspondent, Ashish Joshi, uh, joining us. Um, Ashish, good to see you. Uh, look, every year we seem to use the phrase crisis, winter crisis in the health service. How true is that this year? And, and to what extent is COVID playing a part in that? OK, to answer your second question first, COVID has been stable, flu has been stable, but we are talking about early indicators in September, October. Flu season is beginning to ramp up now. In fact, even today, the Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, was tweeting on his um, ex, or formerly known as Twitter channel, that uh, cases are beginning to rise. So that COVID and flu pressure hasn't been seen on the NHS in the past few weeks or months, but we are beginning to see cases rise. And we know with the NHS, Winter is a very difficult time. Seasonal bugs are around, respiratory illnesses, frailty, falls. All of this happens every winter, and there's no avoiding it. What matters is what kind of state the NHS is to cope with the surge in demand. Well, that, that, that kind of handily leads me on to my next question then, Ashish. I mean, what, what state is the health service in at the moment? We know that there are you know, hundreds of thousands of posts that have been left unfilled. We also know that junior doctors will be striking at a time of the year where there are already those additional pressures on the system. Yeah, look, the, the junior doctor strike is the, is the big cloud hanging over the NHS as we head into Christmas and New Year. This is un unprecedented strike action. We use that term all the time as well, don't we? We say unprecedented strike action, industrial action and winter crisis. But in this case, it's true. I was in a hospital this week. I was speaking to very senior emergency consultants who, who manage emergency departments week in, week out, all through the summer, all through the industrial action. And they are really worried about what's coming in the next few weeks. The three days before Christmas, then you have Christmas itself, and then six days of action early in the new year, and they are really worried. Once the junior doctors go out on strike, the whole system has to effectively pivot and tilt towards just maintaining emergency services. So everything in the hospital has to shunt down the line, and all of the, the back room operations absolutely come to a halt, and that means elective surgeries, those routine operations you were talking about. So they are dreading what is about to come in the next few uh, days, next week, and then early in the new year. They, are, they say this is going to be a very, very testing time. Any sign, any signal at all, Ashish, that, that there, there is the possibility that those strikes can be averted, that talks could lead to negotiated settlement? Or, or are the junior doctors still asking for, for the moon and a stick when they come to you know, those, those double-figure kind of percentage rises in salary? Well, we saw right at the beginning of the industrial action, both sides were completely entrenched. We have a new uh, Secretary of State for Health now. Uh, maybe she can... Uh, gains more ground than her predecessor. We saw the two sides coming together. The consultants' issues have been resolved. So that gave us almost a chink of light. We, we all thought, this is it. If the consultants can agree, they have the same union, the BMA, then the junior doctors can go in. They are negotiating, they're talking, which they didn't do for months and months. They didn't sit around a table. There was a, a lot of bad blood between the former health secretary and the BMA. It was thought that these... these instances now that we saw over the last few weeks, they were leading towards a resolution. But clearly, the BAMA are not happy with the government's stance. It doesn't look like they're going to um, call off these strikes. 
talks will be ongoing in the background, anything to try and avert it. I think we're too close to next week's strike action, but hopefully in the new year, if the government and the BMA can get around a negotiating table and talk some more and try and avert those strikes, the six days together are the ones that the doctors are really worried about, the doctors who, who will be managing the hospitals through this strike action. There's always a, a chance that they can talk, and the government needs to talk, and, and the BMA certainly uh, is looking for an opportunity to call off the strikes if their demands are met. Um, Ashish, let, let, let's park the, the, the crisis in the health service just for a moment, because, frankly, it is Christmas and it is a bit depressing. And instead, let's turn our attention to, oh, yes, uh, synthetic opioids. Another story, frankly, which you've been doing some work on, which at, at, at this time of year is, is deeply depressing. But they're being combined with benzos. Just, just explain exactly what the story is here. So benzos... Uh... A, a, a very commonly prescribed anti-anxiety drug, pills. Benzos cover a whole um, a, a list of brand names and they are commonly prescribed by GPs. Benzos are now becoming very, very popular as a street drug. They are, I think they are now the third most popular um, recreational drug. Uh, addiction agencies are talking about a, a, an increase in, in a, a threefold rise in the number of referrals coming through to them. Benzo-related deaths are um, going up as well. But what you said there, Neil, that's this is the, the really important issue. Synthetic opioids being mixed in with benzos, a cocktail for disaster. These synthetic opioids in really minute um, uh, substances, uh, in, in the doses in these pills, the people who are, are taking handfuls of these benzos simply don't know what's inside them. The, the uh, synthetic opioids are mixed in with these benzos, making them potentially life-threatening, and they're cheap, they're 10 pence a pill, they're available everywhere, a phone, a text, SMS, and they're delivered through your letter box. And benzos are highly addictive. And when mixed with the synthetic opioids, they can be 10 times stronger than fentanyl. It is, it is incredible. More addictive than heroin as well. Ashish, yeah. I suspect that will be a story that you and I return to in 2024. Uh, for now, thanks very much. And you have a lovely Christmas when it comes. You too. Uh, time for us, though, to have a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. A prolonged spell of very heavy rain will affect northwest Scotland this weekend and could lead to flooding, landslides, travel disruption and power cuts. Already, though, a wetter and windier picture across northern and western parts of Scotland. Elsewhere, a cloudy evening with some spots of light rain or drizzle. Tonight, looking to be relatively mild and frost-free under a blanket of cloud with further outbreaks of rain in the northwest, a few clear spells are possible in the east. Uh, the rain, heavy at times, will continue to affect northwest Scotland on Saturday, leading to an increase risk of flooding, mudslips and possible landslides. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, a couple of bits of breaking news uh, to bring you. We've just been hearing uh, from medical officials investigating uh, the death of French star uh, Matthew Perry. In a statement, the County of Los Angeles Department of Medical Examiners determined the cause of death uh, for the 54-year-old actor as the acute effects of ketamine, uh, contributing factors in Mr Perry's death, also said to include drowning, coronary artery disease and the effects of a drug called buprenorphine, actually used, in fact, uh, to treat opioid use. Uh, the uh, Department of Medical Examiner uh, also concluding that the manner of Matthew Perry's death was accidental. Uh, but some... Other breaking news uh, coming into us on a very busy uh, Friday night, in fact. Uh, a jury has awarded election workers in the US state of Georgia $148 million in a defamation case over lies that Rudy Giuliani spread about them. Uh, Mr Giuliani, key member uh, of Donald Trump's team, publicly claimed he would testify during the trial, uh, but ultimately opted not to take the witness stand. He made repeated false claims that a surveillance video showed workers concealing and counting suitcases filled with illegal ballots at a basketball arena in Atlanta that was used to process votes during the 2020 election. Much more on that story, I am sure, over the weekend. But stay with us here on Friday night. Coming up in this week's What to Watch, 
Never mind socks. Why, millions of us love a bit of death and backstabbing at Christmas. That's next. Welcome back. Now, the weekend is here, and with that in mind, we're going to have a look at some of the latest film, gaming and TV releases. Uh, joining us tonight, film and television reviewer Stefan Powell. Stefan, great to have you on, and welcome to Friday Night. Thank you very night. much. Thanks for having me. And we're going, to start, we're going to start with an interesting one, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Tell us about it. It's, of course, a sequel. Yeah, it's a sequel to the 2018 film Aquaman, which is no surprise to anybody. Uh, yeah. It stars the, the great screen presence that is Jason Momoa, who people might remember from uh, Game of Thrones, from mm. Dune, from the Fast and the Furious franchise, and he plays uh, Aquaman, otherwise known as, as Arthur Curry. And this time he is saving Atlantis, like he was not too dissimilar yeah. the last time around, to be fair. <laughs> uh, and I tell you what, instead of me explaining about it, why don't we have a clip and have a look at it? I finally got a job. I'm the king of Atlantis. Half a billion people from every known species in the sea call this place home. But that doesn't mean they all like me. I'm gonna kill Aquaman and destroy everything he holds dear. I'm gonna murder his family. Burn his kingdom 
to ask. I mean, I, I, I was one of those that really actually enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the first one. And, and it, lo cause it looked mm -hmm. gorgeous, I thought. And this looks very similar. Yeah, a lot of green screen, a lot of CGI is mm -hmm. exactly what you expect from a film like this. And Aquaman, the 2018 version, is actually DC, which is the, the competitor to Marvel in the mm -hmm. comic book movie space, was their best performing movie outside of the Christopher Nolan Batman films in, in sort of in the, the noughties. Mm. But I think... This is sort of indicative of the fact that superhero films are sort of starting to lose their luster. There's not that much pep about this one. I know we've seen Jason Momoa popping up on TV shows, plugging it, but it's not getting as much traction, <laughs> really, uh, as superhero films have done in the past. And I think Hollywood is now starting to look at other types of genres that might be moving on from... Because, you know, traditionally, of, of the top ten most grossing films of all time, four of them are superhero films, yep. but the last few years, that trend is going downwards, and I think this isn't doing anything to change that. A, a, a complete crunching gear change moves us on <laughs> to your, 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 your TV, your traditional TV release. Uh, the BBC's got some more... Agatha Christie. Have we not, have we not done Agatha No, we Agatha haven't. More, keep bringing me Agatha Christie. I will have <laughs> Agatha Christie for the rest of my life. Keep it coming. I mean, well, she, the, the queen of crime, mm. I think she's also the queen of Christmas. She certainly is in our household. There's nothing like a, a little murder to keep you going, to make you feel warm <laughs> and fuzzy at Christmas. Uh, but let's have a little look at this adaptation. It's called Murder is Easy. I have to report murder. She was talking of murders in her village, and now she's dead. Someone should go there. Are you one of those men who never know when to leave well enough alone? This village really is a place where murder is easy. I mean, it looks good. It looks good. I'm just, I'm just of the opinion. Have we not done all of Agatha Christie's stories to death? Finally? Well, well, she she died in 1976, and and yet she's still having this massive impact mm. on popular culture now. Not just in in we've seen films, of course, recently, and we well, loads of television, obviously. Poirot at Christmas was was the big thing for years. Also, audiobooks and, and things like that. I think what's interesting about Agatha Christie is that it's like putting on a warm, old pair of slippers, you know exactly <laughs> what you're getting. The characters are, are a bit two-dimensional maybe, mm. but the plots are always fantastic. They keep you guessing and you can kind of watch it and, try and you never know what's gonna happen. And that formula has never been matched mm. by anybody else really. And that's why you get things like this. The BBC is since 2015 is that Agatha Christie back on a Christmas. She's gonna be here for a while. You might be doing I'm that not. face. You can do that face all you want, Neil, but she, she's gonna be around for a while yet. All I'm saying is <laughs> Raymond Chandler, that's your man. Not, not Agatha Christie. However, let's move on to the streaming services. And this, this is one that I, I have been really looking forward to. Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon, tell us. Yeah, well, we've been talking about superhero films there. Zack mm. Snyder, of course, was the, the hero of the superhero sort of space mm. for a while. He made Justice League and he made the Superman versus Batman. And we were talking about Hollywood looking for the new uh, superhero film. Maybe they were getting tired. Perhaps sci-fi is going to be their answer for that. Uh, this is what he's done with his new sci-fi extravaganza called Rebel Moon. Everything. You're delusional. You think those soldiers will show their mercy? Stop. So, it, I mean, it, it looks. It looks pretty good. It sounds good, that noise that's in every sci-fi yeah, these yeah, yeah. days as well. What doesn't look quite so good are the reviews. Yeah, so I think if Hollywood were looking for, it, for the, the follow-on from a superhero film, mm. if these reviews are anything to go by, they're going to be keeping on looking because we're having one-star reviews in The Guardian, one-star reviews in The Independent, IGN, the pop culture website, that's mm. usually a bit more accepting of these types of films, only four out of ten. So I think it's fair to say that Zack Snyder's attempt at sci-fi is not quite reaching the high notes that perhaps he has done in his past. Mm, yes, I think that is an understatement there, Stefan. <laughs> um, but briefly, if you can, because, of course, it's not just TV, it's not just films. We, we often overlook, I think, the gaming industry. And as a gamer myself, you know, still to this day, I was looking forward to this one. Avatar, Frontiers yeah. of Pandora. Well, it's the big release for the games industry in the UK, of course, um, mm. and across the world. Of course, the games industry in the UK makes more money than the movie and music Absolutely. industry combined. Absolutely. Uh, this one is a beautiful, gorgeous-looking well, look game, like we can see now. It's, it's, a, it's a real uh, treat to the eyes. Not necessarily a treat for fans of good stories or, or you know, <laughs> developing plot lines, uh, but, you know, it's a sort of solid 7 out of 10, a fun to pick up and play for about 25 hours. It's a beautiful, gorgeous world they've created, but there's nothing really to go and explore outside of the main storyline, which is what really lets it down. 
fun to play, beautiful to look at, but it's not going to make your mind work particularly hard, I think. We're not going to make, not going to tug oh. those emotional heartstrings. Do you know what? I'm just hoping Santa might put that in my stocking this year. But he won't know, because I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch. Yeah, so. unless you want a 7 out of 10 stocking, then I'd go for something else. Stefan, lovely to have you in. Uh, we will be much. seeing you again, I'm sure, in the new year. Um, but have a lovely Christmas. You too, thank you very much. You take care. Uh, time now to find out what is happening in the sport. Teddy is standing by. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Well, Stuart, it's been a few months now since the end of what was an incredible Ashes series. How are you adjusting now to life after playing cricket? Yeah, really enjoying it. You know, I think ultimately finishing on my own terms was really important for me and I knew that I wanted to finish um, by my last ball playing for England. Uh, England versus Australia was a, a major pinnacle for me in Ashes cricket and it was such an exciting and exhilarating series that I almost got to the stage where I don't know if it gets any better than this really. So, yeah, that, it, was, it was great to be able to sort of make the decision on my own, finish on my own terms and... Um, I don't think it will really properly hit me until the test team play again and Jimmy Anderson and Ben Stokes are walking out with an England cap on in their whites. I think that might sort of feel real that I, I won't ever do that again. But no, at the moment I've got no regrets and, and feel really happy. In the book you spoke about the fact that retirement only really came to you during the Old Trafford test. So you came to a massive decision quite quickly. Yeah, within 10 days I think. So yeah, it was pretty stressful. You know, ultimately any time you walk away from something you love, it's really difficult. And I was loving playing cricket. I was loving working under Stokesy and Baz. Uh, it was great fun. I didn't feel much pressure. Uh, the communication was really good. And I was bowling really well and felt fit. So a lot of those things would say, carry on playing. And I honestly felt like I could do another couple of years. But I kept sort of bringing myself back to what's my next Everest? What's my next major challenge? I always need a challenge because I've got this goal to always continuously improve. I need something to charge towards and, and chase. And whenever I've written down in my whole career, what's my next Everest? Bang, within 30 seconds I've written down and I know what to target. And I just couldn't quite nail something down. So I think that ultimately told me that it was the right time to, to move and, and try something different. Next Ash is two years away. Would that have felt too far when you were making that decision a few months ago? No, I think, I, I think I'd still be fit and fresh to play. Um, but I know that young, uh, a young family played a part as well. You know, uh, Annabelle is turning one. Uh, the travels a lot in international cricket and the, the young years are so valuable. Ultimately, I'm 37. Uh, next Ashes would be 39. And although I, I still feel like I'd be able to play, I didn't want to sacrifice some sort of memories and special moments I could share with my family up until then because you have to dedicate your life to, to playing for England. You have to dedicate everything to it. And, um, you know, I, I've done that for 17 years uh, and, you know, it's time to still feel... This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Uh, Teddy, thanks very much indeed. Uh, we are going to take a short break, but coming up afterwards, move over, Megan. Another royal has decided to launch a new podcast. Could she do with a few tips from an expert like me? The answer is yes. The tips are after this. I'm Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt 
I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Come Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News, at the Old Bailey. Welcome back. Now, as you may or may not know, and if you don't know why, uh, this is not the only show that I present. You can also find me on the Sky News Daily Podcast, where every weekday we take a look at one particularly interesting thing in the news and spend a good bit of time trying to get a better understanding of it. But it seems that I've got a bit of competition in the podcast charts this week from Her Majesty the Queen, no less. Each week, we'll hear from Her Majesty the Queen herself. I don't think I came out from under a chair for a very long time, <laughs> after I saw it for the first time. For the book lovers and those who wish to fall a little bit more in love with books. Mm, yes, Her Maj has launched her own podcast. Well, I have a few tips for you, Camilla, because I know you're a very big fan of the show. For a really good podcast, one, you need an A-list presenter, two, you need a top production team, and three, you need a great subject. Luckily, on the Sky News Daily, we have all three of those. Well, maybe two out of three ain't bad. Anyway, this week on the Daily, well, we have been talking to our security and defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark. What about? Well, Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, and his visit to the United States. Uh, Michael was explaining to me why the Republicans have been holding up that much-needed aid. There's two sort of schools. One are the mainstream Republicans who want to help Ukraine and they're playing hardball with it, saying, well, you know, this will probably be agreed, but not until you, President Biden, have done more about immigration in the, in the southern states. Build that wall. Exactly. So they're, they're using it as a... But I think they may have overplayed their hand because yeah. already it's too late to do a deal. Yeah. There's another element in the Republican movement, the MAGA people, Make America Great Again, the Trumpists, who actually, they don't really want to help Ukraine at all because they quite like the idea of Putin winning. And they, they like the idea of Putin winning because they think that a world of Trump and Putin and Xi Jinping will be a world that's really quite conducive to them. 
Mm. Uh, Michael also talking us through well, the, 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 the realities of the Ukrainian counter-offensive. Uh, that really hasn't worked. And that, of course, is something that has been picked up on uh, by Republicans in the United States and indeed by others here in Europe. Vladimir Zelensky also asking the European Union for some money, which as yet has to materialise. Much, much more, of course, on the Ukrainian war uh, available on the Sky News Daily feed. Uh, for now, though, let's check in, see how the weather's looking. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, now, there has been a prolonged spell of very heavy rain affecting northwest Scotland this weekend, and it could lead to flooding landslides, travel disruption, and even power cuts. Just look at that. Already, though, it is a wetter and windier picture across uh, northern and, indeed, western parts of Scotland. Elsewhere, it is a cloudy evening with some spots of light rain or drizzle, mainly over western hills. Tonight will be relatively mild and frost-free under a blanket of cloud with further outbreaks of rain in the northwest. A few clear spells possible in the east. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And that is your lot for Friday night for this week. Next Friday, I'm going to be joined by the superstar comedian Maisie Adam. Uh, but up next here on Sky News, it's Gillian with News at 10. I'll be seeing you next week.